I don't need that. Okay, thanks. Well, I'd like to uh, uh, discuss some questions about a uh, topic that uh, goes back to classical antiquity, has remains quite obscure in many ways, and has uh, many uh, significant implications, I think, which I'll try to bring out, or at least indicate. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the fundamental nature of language? Uh, what's it for? What is it designed for? Uh, there's a, a simple classical formula, uh, goes back to Aristotle, that uh, language is uh, sound with meaning. That raises three questions at once. Uh, what is sound? Uh, what is meaning? And what is with? Uh, the, the most neglected and most crucial question. Uh, there's been a good deal of discussion of sound in, uh, over the past uh, several millennia. A good bit is known. A lot of consideration of questions of meaning, uh, how much is understood, one could debate. Uh, but virtually nothing about uh, with. Uh, presumably because it was assumed to be trivial, uh, simply by association. So a child sees a cow and somebody says cow, and an association is set up between that thing over there and the word, and out of that spins the meaning. Uh, that doesn't survive much examination, uh, but uh, even if it did, it wouldn't begin to touch the real question, uh, which, has to do with, which has to do with the fact that the a, a number of associations of that kind, if you want to call them associations, is uh, unbounded. So it can't be set up by experience. Uh, that's the with problem. It's very rarely been noticed in the whole history of thinking about language. Occasionally it has. Uh, Galileo was maybe the first to uh, point out a pretty obvious fact uh, that uh, the language we, uh, our uh, language capacity has infinite scope. Uh, he described the alphabet as the greatest invention that had ever been made because it enables us with 25 letters to express uh, any thought that might come to our minds. Uh, notice that he's not accepting Aristotle's dictum exactly. Uh, that's a, an, a description of language as meaning with sound, which is not quite the same as sound with meaning. In fact, differs in interesting ways. This is picked up not long after by Descartes. Uh, and in fact, for Descartes, it's uh, the foundation, uh, one of the foundations of his uh, dualistic science is interesting and long story, also mostly ignored in the history of philosophy, but I think quite crucial. Uh, after that, it kind of languishes. It picks up again in the 20th century, uh, partly because the concept with came to be understood uh, in, the few, by, uh, in the 1930s and 40s with the development of the uh, theories of computability, Turing, uh, Gödel, Clean any others. Uh, the notion of a finite characterization of an infinite class became uh, uh, well understood, and uh, that makes it possible to ask ourselves what would be the uh, uh, nature of the uh, sound meaning relationship, whatever it is. Well, the basic answer has to be that there's some kind of what's called generative procedure, finite computational procedure uh, that determines the structures and the interpretations for an infinite range of categories of uh, expressions. And the interpretations have to be dual, one for sound, one for meaning. Uh, apart from that, uh, uh, for anyone who's not a mystic, uh, this capacity is internal to us. Uh, it's generally denied, but uh, a lot of mystics around, but uh, cl clearly it's something internal to us, mostly our brains, uh, which means it's effectively, the capacity is effectively uh, an organ of the body in the rather loose sense of organ that's used conventionally in biology. Some uh, 
subsystem of the organism that has enough internal integrity so it can be studied on its own and interacts with other such modules, systems, subsystems in the functioning of the, in the life of the organism. Uh, so that should be uncontroversial, and fortunately it isn't, but I'll put those controversies aside. Well, we've learned in recent years that the concept sound is too narrow. Uh, the uh, externalization of language, the form in which it reaches the outside, seems to be modality independent. So it can be a visual, it can be sign, it can be touch, uh, a lot of interesting work on that, and so on. There seems to be some internal analytic capacity that's common to any form of uh, uh, external uh, expression. Now that already suggests to us that maybe Aristotle's dictum should be inverted, just as Galileo's observation does. Maybe it should be meaning with not sound, but some form of externalization. Well, I'll keep the sound here just for simplicity, but I mean any form of externalization. Uh, well, uh, if, uh, it, turns, it turns out that this distinction between whether language is sound with meaning or meaning with sound uh, it bears on many other questions. Uh, the, uh, uh, there is a debate over the uh, what's sometimes called the essential function of language. We'll come back to that notion in a minute. Uh, there's a traditional view, which in fact is Galileo's, uh, that language is uh, primarily an instrument of thought. The great 19th century linguist uh, William Dwight Whitney expressed the traditional conception this way. He said, language is audible thinking, the spoken instrumentality of thought which means that speech, sound, any other externalization is kind of a secondary property of language. The fundamental property is the uh, internal construction of indefinitely many thoughts by this generative procedure, we'd now say. Uh, that's different from a contemporary view, which is so widespread as to be virtually a dogma, uh, namely that the function of language is communication and that grew out of the, evolved out of communication systems. Uh, the matter hasn't been studied, but I suspect that this modern view, which is in fact a dogma, you just can't question it, uh, is uh, in philosophy, uh, psychology, linguistics, is uh, probably a, a reflection of the grip of associationism and behaviorism. It's of 20th century doctrines, uh, which have a very uh, a tight grip. Even those who reject them fundamentally accept them, I think. Uh, it also relates to a highly oversimplified view of uh, modern evolutionary biology, uh, which is totally different from what evolutionary biologists believe, but is also widespread. Oh, interesting topic, another one I'll put aside. Uh, looking at the general question, uh, the question of what an organ is for, uh, what's its function, is uh, uh, very far from is far from clear. Uh, so take any any system you like. Say take the spine. Uh, what's its function? Well, its function is to hold the body up, uh, to protect the nerves, to uh, produce blood cells, uh, to store calcium. Uh, that's what it does, so which one is its function? Uh, maybe all of them, or you pick one somehow. Well, the way one, one is usually picked is by evolutionary considerations. Uh, which, which of those various uses is, how, is the way it evolved? Uh, you can give arguments like that about the spine, uh, but you can't really do it about language. There's a huge literature growing all the time on what's called evolution of language, as if the library's full of it now, last 20 or 30 years mainly, which is very curious in some, a number of ways. Uh, for one reason, it's curious because the topic doesn't exist. Uh, languages don't evolve. Uh, they change, but they don't evolve. That's quite different. Uh, evolution means change in the uh, genetic basis for language, what's called uh, 
universal grammar, UG, and contemporary terminology. Uh, the, uh, it's also interesting to compare the uh, uh, huge uh, library of speculations, and they are speculations, about what's called evolution of language, really means evolution of the capacity for language. Uh, compare that with uh, uh, incomparably similar, uh, simpler topics, like uh, evolution of the communication system of bees. Uh, by any measure, that's a far simpler question. But it's barely studied in biology because it's recognized to be too hard. Uh, on the other hand, evolution of the language capacity, which is incomparably more difficult, uh, not only because of the complexity, but you don't have fossil evidence and so on. You don't have, uh, uh, that's uh, a huge topic. Now, actually, a little bit is known about it, and not very much. And what is known is suggestive. I'll come back to what it indicates. Uh, the uh, uh, the one, one thing that is known with considerable confidence is that in the past roughly 50 to 80,000 years since uh, humans left Africa, our ancestors left Africa, there's been no evolution of the language capacity. It's, changed, it's stayed identical. And there's very strong evidence for that. Uh, there's no difference that's detectable in capacity for language any language uh, in a Papua New Guinea uncontacted tribe and uh, you know Dublin uh, children are interchanged they they'll grow up the way their society is and that seems to be true of cognitive capacities generally if there are group differences they're so subtle that they're virtually undetectable so that tells us that uh, something at least uh, the UG, the language capacity, hadn't changed, hasn't evolved in roughly 50,000 or more years. Uh, the, uh, with less confidence, but some, uh, you can suggest that if you go back another 50 or 100,000 years before that, there probably wasn't any language at all. Uh, there, if you look at the archaeological, of course we have no fossil, fossil record, but if you look at the archaeological evidence, there is a, a sudden uh, leap in creative activity, sometimes called the Great Leap Forward by paleoanthropologists, uh, roughly around 75,000, 100,000 years ago, somewhere in that neighborhood. And it's uh, you know, complex tools, uh, complex social arrangements, uh, 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 numerical development of numerical uh, representation of planetary, you know, uh, celestial uh, uh, events, and so on and so forth. It's generally assumed, sort of plausibly, that's that that's connected with the emergence of language, uh, which uh, a differ with human language, which uh, differs radically along any dimension you can think of from uh, other. Uh, communi from any communication system that exists in other animals, primates, and so on. Well, uh, these are among the reasons, of course, everyone would like to know something about the neural basis for language, uh, but it's uh, very difficult to explore the topic. Uh, one reason is it's disconnected, it's unrelated to any other systems that are known. Uh, so we know a lot about uh, the human visual system but that's because the human visual system is quite similar to the visual systems of, say, monkeys and cats. And rightly or wrongly, we allow ourselves to carry out invasive experimentation with other organisms. So you can learn about their visual systems. That tells you something about ours. Uh, so something about the neurophysiology of the human visual system is understood. Uh, but that's not going to work for language. There just are no other organisms, so there's no other one to look at uh, because there's no analogous system anywhere in the biological world. There's kind of very weak analogies, uh, you know, with birds, and ants, but it's evolutionarily so remote can't possibly tell you anything. Uh, it's uh, so the com comparative study is out, and we don't allow ourselves to do invasive experiments with humans. You can think of all kinds of possible experiments that could teach you a lot, but you can't carry them out. Uh, so that means uh, research in this domain has to be 
sophisticated and uh, indirect. Uh, some things are learned, but uh, not a lot. Uh, nevertheless, I think it is possible to say something about the essential function of language, you know, the core property of it. Uh, but the way to do that, the only way I know, since comparative evidence is out and neurophysiological evidence is limited, there's some, I'll mention some, uh, but there is a way to do it. And that's to look into the way in which language, into language design. What kind of a system is it when you investigate its character? And another uh, way of approaching it is to compare, is to consider questions of communicative efficiency. What would be in a, a system that is efficient for communication? Uh, compare it with design of language and in particular compare it with questions of uh, computational efficiency. There's, there is an assumption here. The assumption is that however language developed, it satisfied, a, it's a computational system, so it satisfied a general principles of computational efficiency, which are not specifically linguistic or even biological, maybe laws of nature. Uh, so granting that assumption for which there's a good deal of evidence, not only in this, but in other domains. Uh, we can ask about computational efficiency and communicative efficiency and ask uh, how they interrelate. Well, I think uh, considerations of that, that kind, I'll barely have a chance to hint at them, uh, do suggest quite strongly that the traditional view is correct, that language is an instrument of thought informally, and that the modern dogmas about language and communication are just wrong. Uh, communication is, an, an, is a use of language, of course, but there's plenty of other uses as well. Uh, and uh, it's a secondary, it's not really a critical part of language and, and not, uh, not particularly specific to language. You can communicate in all kinds of other ways, in style of dress, uh, you know, how you comb your hair, um, you know, facial expressions, uh, innumerable ways to communicate. Language, of course, is one, but nothing special about the connection. Well, uh, this, uh, uh, these questions began to take a clear form uh, approximately 60 years ago when there were the first serious efforts to try to actually construct uh, generative procedures, computational procedures that would meet the minimum condition required, namely uh, a, 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 a generating a, an infinite array of unstructured, of structured expressions which have uh, an interpretation in these two uh, interfaces, as they're called, uh, meaning and externalization sound. And as soon as those attempts were made, some very puzzling phenomena were discovered. That's commonly the case. When you begin to look at some topic closely, it turns out that everything you believed was wrong. Actually, that's the classic moment of the origins of modern science. So for millennia, uh, scientists had believed that uh, there are simple answers to the question why uh, if you let go of a rock, it falls, and if you release uh, steam, it rises. Uh, there going to their natural place, and uh, how do objects interact uh, through sympathies and antipathies? Uh, how do you perceive a triangle? Uh, there's a triangle over there, and a form flits through the air, and gets into your brain, and there's a triangle in there, and so on for a range of questions. Uh, these were the conclusions of the best scientists, literally for millennia. Uh, when Galileo and Others uh, began to be agreed to be puzzled about these phenomena instead of just accepting them. It immediately turned out that all your intuitions are totally wrong. Um, you know the rest of the story. Uh, that's how science starts. That's how uh, discovery starts, and intelligent inquiry starts in any domain. It's been very hard for this to penetrate to the, to the soft sciences uh, and the humanities. It, just isn't grasped uh, right to the present day, even in fields close to the sciences, like uh, in this domain, uh, uh, computational cognitive science, totally misunderstood.
Uh, but the ability to be puzzled is a pretty important one to try to cultivate. It's the core property, the thing that things had learned from infancy up through graduate school and beyond. Uh, well, uh, one puzzle about language that came to light about 60 years ago and is still very much debated and bears on the question of raising uh, it has to do with a very simple but rather curious fact. So take, say, the sentence, instinctively eagles that fly swim, and ask yourself what instinctively goes with. Well, it goes with swim, not with fly. Or similarly, suppose you raise a question and you ask, uh, can eagles that fly swim? Well, the can goes with swim, not with fly. Uh, which is a curious fact because a computational procedure is involved which is quite complex. Uh, there, there is a minimal distance relation that is true of the actual linkage, but it's minimal structural distance. It's distance, it's the closest, the two things that are closest to each other when you look into the structures. And that's a computational, complex computational problem. On the other hand, it worked the other way, uh, through proximity instead of structural distance, it would be a trivial computational problem. You just check the closest verb to instinctively or to can, and that's the one it's associated with. Now that's elementary, elementary computational problem. But uh, language doesn't use the simple computation. It uses a complex one, which ought to be puzzling, uh, and is puzzling, I think. And in, uh, it's not just true of these examples. It's true of every construction that's known in every language that's known. So there's something far-reaching about it. Uh, well, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the general principle, minimal search, you know, closest distance, that's all over the place in language. And uh, probably it's just uh, kind of a ref uh, effect of the general property of minimal computation that I mentioned. Uh, in this case, there is some supporting evidence from neuroscience. Uh, one of the most interesting experimental results in neuroscience has to do exactly with this. Uh, it involved, it's, an exp it's a work done in Milan. Uh, the, for those of you who are linguists, the linguist involved is Andrea Moro, other biologists. Uh, the, uh, they investigated the following paradigm. Take, uh, say, speakers of German and, uh, and give them two nonsense languages, invented languages. Uh, one of which satisfies the properties of, say, Italian, which they don't know, and the other uh, is designed to violate principles of universal grammar. So in this connection, uh, take an invented language in which the, you negate a sentence by putting the negative particle after the third word, let's say. Uh, language does it in a much more complex way with using structural distance. Well, it turns out that uh, for the case of the nonsense language that satisfies UG principles, you get normal brain activation in the uh, uh, language areas. Uh, for the case that violates UG principles, like having negation as the third word in a sentence, uh, you get a lot of brain activation all over the place, and people can ultimately solve the problem. But it's evident that the teaching, they're treating as a puzzle and not as, a link, not as a language problem. Uh, there's also some evidence, some of you may know this, from uh, observation of cognitively impaired but uh, linguistically capable subjects. Uh, Neil Smith's work with his famous sub subject, uh, they did dry experiments like this and compared with normals, and you find pretty much the same thing. Uh, well, that. Uh, yields a suggestion, a possible explanation for the curious fact that a child reflexively uses structural distance, minimizes structural distance, and ignores the much more simple computational process of uh, linear distance. Uh, the assumption would be that linear order is simply not available to the language learner. 
who's confronted with examples like the ones I mentioned. Uh, rather, the learner is guided by a UG principle, a principle of uh, language capacity, which simply says there is no such thing as linear order. Uh, it's just uh, uh, there's only structural properties, uh, and you have to minimize those. And uh, uh, that uh, conclusion has uh, caused a lot of consternation in the cognitive sciences. There's actually a small industry uh, in computational cognitive science uh, trying to demonstrate that you can get these results by a statistical analysis of massive amounts of data, uh, paper after paper on that. Uh, every approach that's clear enough to look at fails irremediably. Uh, furthermore, it wouldn't make any difference if they worked because they're not dealing with the right question. Uh, suppose you could show for the cases in English that I mentioned that you could somehow, the child could learn this by statistical analysis of data, uh, which is totally impossible. But suppose you could show it, it would be totally meaningless uh, because the question is, why does language do it this way? Always, not just for these cases, but every case, not just in English, but in every language. Uh, why does no child ever make a mistake about it? Uh, it why is it basically reflexive? And that question uh, wouldn't be addressed, even if impossibly some of these approaches worked. Uh, papers keep coming out about it. And that's actually a good illustration of the unwillingness to be puzzled that uh, has to be overcome if science is even going to begin to take off. Well, a more far-reaching thesis is that uh, linear order is never available for computation uh, in the core areas of language, in uh, syntax, sentence construction, and semantic interpretation. Uh, uh, there's actually considerable evidence for that in other domains, too. It seems that structural properties, like, say, hierarchy, uh, play a role, but order does not. Uh, languages that have, say, almost mirror image word orders uh, operate exactly the same way. Uh, the, uh, uh, this suggests that the linear order is only a peripheral part of the uh, language system. And you can understand why it's there. The sensory motor system requires it. So you can't speak in parallel, let's say, and you can't speak in structures. You have to speak in a sequence of uh, linear order of words. So linear order has to be imposed somewhere in other arrangements. Uh, but it looks like it's just a reflex of the sensory motor system. Well, one of the few things that's known about evolution with fair confidence is that the sensory motor system was around for hundreds of thousands of years before language ever emerged. It doesn't seem to be adapted to the uh, language system. Uh, apes, for example, have approximately the same auditory system as humans and even focus on the same kinds of uh, phonetic features, phonological features that are essential for human language. But of course, when they hear uh, language, it's just noise. They don't hear anything. Actually, there's another uh, striking curiosity that's almost never been studied. Uh, again, a failure to be puzzled is how come a, an infant, a one-day-old infant, can pick out of all the noise around them uh, some subpart which is language-related? It's a very tricky task, if you think about it. Uh, if uh, some other, even an, org an ape, let's say, with essentially the same auditory system, is presented with the same noise, it's just noise. Uh, but for an infant, it's not noise. Some scattered part of it is language related, and that's reflexively picked up and goes on almost reflexively to gain the capabilities we're now using, including such properties as the one I mentioned, that you can't use linear order in the internal computations, uh, despite the computational simplicity of it. Well, that suggests already that uh, uh, you should, that we should probably return to the traditional concept of language. 
a concept that Galileo, Descartes, and others expressed, that Whitney articulated in the form I mentioned. Uh, and uh, particular, uh, and recognize that externalization altogether is a peripheral part of the whole language system, uh, just reflecting uh, accidental aspects of the sensory motor system, which we have to use for externalization. And of course, it would follow from that that uh, particular uses of language, like uh, communication, are even more peripheral and secondary uh, uh, to basic language. And, uh, and all the extensive speculation about evolution of language uh, is just off the off the mark to begin with. You can throw out the libraries for this reason alone. Actually, there, there is evidence from, ev some evidence from the limited evolutionary evidence around that that conclusion is correct. I won't have time to go into that. Well, uh, if there were time, I would, uh, and there isn't, I would go on to give some more complex examples which require a little more thought and attention. But when you look into more complex questions of somatic interpretation and communicative efficiency, what you can show pretty convincingly, I think, that, uh, that the design of language yields, directly yields the basis for somatic interpretation, but constructs problems for communication. Uh, it, mean, it, uh, it, uh, it introduces properties into the, what is pronounced that uh, uh, cause a lot of uh, what are called parsing problems, problems of perception and so on. And there's many examples of this. In fact, every case, I won't have time to go into it, but every case that's known of a conflict between communicative efficiency and computational efficiency, that is best language design, every single case that's known, and there's quite a variety, uh, communicative efficiency is just disregarded. Uh, it, uh, you know, hands down, always uh, computational efficiency that is good design for somatic interpretation uh, wins out. And uh, that uh, tells you something quite general. Uh, the, uh, I'll skip a lot of stuff because there's no time. Uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, suggests, uh, apart from the particular conclusion here that the modern dogmas are probably all off the wall, that uh, communication is not a fundamental part of language, it's very peripheral uh, uh, along with other uses, that uh, the language is designed basically as an instrument of thought, uh, result, it developed apparently very quickly, uh, some small rewiring of the brain, maybe you know, 100,000 years ago, which is nothing in evolutionary time, uh, simply provided the computational procedure, simple computational procedure, which yields the, which answers the question with, except that it modifies it and that the externalization part is secondary, a matter of adapting it to a sensory motor system that was all around. but. Uh, a kind of a more general point that I would kind of like to bring up, and I won't go into, but you can think about, uh, is that uh, if, you, if you make if, if you, uh, close attention to rather technical properties of the nature of language, uh, specific technical questions, uh, they can lead to conclusions that have uh, quite far-reaching ramifications about the nature of our fundamental mental processes uh, 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 and the consequences of considerable significance, I think, for the human sciences, even in their uh, currently barely developed form. So let me stop there. Mm -hmm.
externalization uh, as opposed to the hierarchical. Are you asking a question about the way people think about it, or no, about the modern dogma, or about the facts? And um, well, I'm asking you a question, perhaps, why the dogma is a dogma. Why the dogma exists? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, I think, as I said, it hasn't been studied, but I think it's pretty <coughs> obvious. Uh, the 20th century uh, underwent a shift of attitudes towards uh, humans and their actions and so on. Uh, basically, associationism. Uh, and then general behavioralism. So you go back 50 years ago, uh, uh, the, psycho the psychology was called behavioral science. Uh, sociology was behavioral science. Everything was behavioral science, which is a very, uh, it's the time when I sort of was in grad school. Or, uh, I was one of a few people who thought, this is pretty crazy, uh, even without knowing the, any conclusions. I mean, to call, say psychology, behavioral science, is like calling physics uh, meter reading science. Because uh, you know, the data for physics is reading meters. And the, some of the data, not all of it, some of the data from, for psychology is behavior, not all of it. But uh, it means that looking at the field as a study of data, not as a study of whatever the internal structures are. And, just doesn't make any sense. Uh, the, uh, uh, it combined with this was something else. Right about this period, computers were being developed, actual working computers. And it was widely believed, and still is, that uh, sooner or later there'll be you know, these massive computers with very rapid processing, and uh, they can deal with huge amounts of data, and, carry out some statistical procedure on the data and something miraculous will come out. It's still very widely believed. And people are very misled by it. In fact, there's, a, in, there's something called the Turing test, which you've probably heard about, which uh, every year there's a competition. If you win it, you get $100,000 uh, to pass something called the Turing test, a totally meaningless t task. It's uh, uh, it's, it, it, it's supposed to show, it, can you show that machines think? It's all based on a paper of Alan Turing, who was a great mathematician and one of the founders of computational science. And uh, there's an eight page paper that he wrote in 1950 on uh, whether machines can think. But he starts off the paper by saying, the question whether machines can think is too meaningless to deserve discussion. Uh, that sentence has somehow been ignored in the entire literature. And there's a good reason for it. Uh, because uh, you know, to ask whether machines think is basically asking what kind of metaphor you like. It's like asking, do submarines swim? You know, well, you know, from a certain point of view, you can say so. From another point of view, not. But it's not a meaningful question. Uh, he, propo he proposed this imitation game, which is now called the Turing test, but he proposed it for a different reason. Uh, he said it's, it's, it'll be interesting to, the idea is to see if you can construct a program that'll uh, delude a, a blind observer, you know, one who doesn't see what's going on, to not be able to distinguish the program from a person. Okay. He says it'll be useful for trying to, as a challenge, to create bigger machines, better machines. Okay, maybe so, in fact, probably was. But it doesn't tell you anything about whether machines can think. In fact, the whole idea of machines thinking is posed in a way which is almost designed to cause confusion. I should say that the people who are confused by this are some of the most the leading philosophers, the most influential philosophers, and scientists and others. It's not a trivial thing. I won't mention names, but many of you know. Uh, for one thing, a machine, the computer itself, is maybe useful as a paperweight. It doesn't do anything. Uh, what is doing anything is the program that you put into it. Okay, so the real, qu if you want to pose the meaningless question, it should be, can programs think? Well, what's a program? A program is just a theory uh, written in a crazy notation so that a machine can, a computer can implement it. <laughs> 
So the question really is, well, can this theory think? In other words, is this a theory of thinking? Well, you know, the answer is not unless you understand something about theory of thinking. Uh, nothing's a theory of X just because it passes some meaningless test. You know, it's a theory of X if it gives you some insight and understanding into the nature of X. Uh, so the real question is, uh, are the theories that are written in these programs uh, giving us some insight into the nature of thinking? And as soon as you pose that question, you don't even bother with the prize, because of course they're not, not doing anything. Uh, and uh, uh, that, these things combined, the associationist psychology, uh, the behavioral turn in the human sciences, the availability of data processing, they all combined to lead to what in my view is just massive confusion in all the fields related to these topics. Uh, that's probably the reason, I mean, you know, you have to look at individuals and ask, but I think if you do, you find something like that. And it's right to the present. I mean, it hasn't changed in the least. Yeah. Call. place, but if you uh, just think about it for a minute, uh, probably 99.9% .9 of your use of language is internal. Uh, it doesn't involve any other people. So you can't, it's, it takes a tremendous act of will uh, not to think to yourself in language. It's almost impossible. Uh, every minute of the day you're talking to yourself, uh, you're, uh, when you sleep, you know, doing the same thing. Now, there are cases of the kind that you describe. Now, there are all kinds of uses of the system, uh, just like there are all kinds of uses of the spine. Uh, but uh, that doesn't tell you much. Uh, in fact, if you really look closely, this has not been studied. There's another dogma here that's blocking the study of this. It's a dogma that in the modern period actually goes back to pretty much to Quine and then it's picked up by John Searle and others. Uh, the idea that there can't be anything in the mind that is not available to introspection. Nothing can be in the mind unless you, it may not be conscious, but it's got to be available to consciousness. Otherwise, it's not in the mind. Uh, that's uh, totally hopeless. Uh, most of what g goes on internally is completely beyond the level of introspection. Uh, for example, the, the case that I mentioned. I mean, the principle which is pretty well established that linear order is not available for syntactic and semantic computation. You can't introspect into that. You, it's not conscious. Uh, the same is true of just visual perception. For example, one of the most interesting results in the study of visual perception is a, a conclusion that came out of uh, David Marr's lab, Shimon Ullman's principle, what, what's called the rigidity principle. Uh, this, they were able to show that if you present a subject with uh, uh, a tachistoscopic presentations, you know, it's a screen with a couple of dots on it, if you have successive presentations, not many, maybe three or four presentations of a few dots on the screen, what you perceive is a rigid object in motion. Okay, that's pretty curious too. Uh, in experience, you don't you have no experience with rigid objects. Uh, throughout all of human history, till very recently, there weren't any rigid objects. Like if you walk in a forest, you no know rigid objects around. And, uh, but somehow the system 
uh, it's probably true for other, uh, it hasn't been really tested on other organisms, it's hard to test, but it's probably true for apes and cats and so on. Uh, our system is just designed to impose uh, rigid objects in motion on virtually no data. And uh, that, by now, the mathematical properties have been worked out, the neurological properties less known. But again, you can't bring that to consciousness. And I think the same is true of speaking to yourself. Try it sometime. Think about what you're actually doing when you talk to your, what you call talking to yourself. I think you'll find that what you're actually, what's actually in your mind consciously is just fragments. Little fragments flit by. And out of those fragments, you can suddenly construct a sentence, a meaningful sentence. And that meaningful sentence is probably being constructed unconsciously, beyond the level of consciousness, internally, by whatever these generative processes are. And bits and pieces of it reach consciousness, like a couple of fragments of phrases. And that's what we call thinking to ourselves. And by now, that's, uh, you know, that, that seems to be true in other domains, too. There's some, by now, famous experiments, the Libet experiments on uh, uh, decision-making, which have been widely misinterpreted. Uh, but what was found was that if you decide to do something, say, I decide to pick this up, uh, milliseconds before I decide, uh, something's going on in the motor areas, uh, namely the, the right you know, organization of motion to pick it up. Well, you know, the immediate conclusion was, that was drawn from this is, okay, that shows there's no freedom of will. It doesn't show anything of the sort. Uh, what it shows is that everything that's going on is beyond the level of consciousness, uh, which we know in every other domain, too. But as long as philosophy of mind is going to be bound by this dogma that you can't go beyond what's available to consciousness, or else it's not in the mind, it's never going to discover anything. Uh, and I, I think, and, and there's a whole collection, and I think that dogma too probably goes back to behaviorism. I mean, it's pretty clear in Quine's case. It's uh, Quine, you may remember, distinguishes, uh, it says actions can be in accord with principles or guided by principles. That's all. Uh, in accord with principles means like the planets following Kepler's laws. You know, uh, it, guided by principles means you formulate what you're going to do and then you do it. And uh, say virtually all action doesn't fall in any of those categories, either of those categories. And with John Searle, it comes up as what he calls his association principle. You know, have to have has to be available to consciousness somehow before it can be attributed to the mind. And a whole spins off a whole theory about rules and so on. Uh, but that's just. Uh, approaching these questions with your hands tied behind your back. And I think the same is true of the considerations that you mentioned. They're real, but it's very peripheral to, to the use of language. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so does that mean, I mean, well, I suppose more, more centrally what I was maybe thinking is, is, is whether you think that uh, if you were raised without an external language, without a shared language, you're a regular, so you're a desert island, Experiment. What would happen? Yeah, I mean, will, is that person well, there's actually some it? evidence about this. Um, there are <coughs> the most striking evidence is uh, studies. There's a couple of studies of uh, children who were found whose uh, who uh, whose deaf children who were whose parents had been indoctrinated into what's called the oralist tradition, which is very common until pretty recently. Uh, that is that deaf children should not be to allowed to learn sign language uh, because uh, they have to be part of the general society, so they have to learn how to lip read. Uh, it just makes no sense at all by now, at least in sensible areas that's all been dropped. But that was a major dogma for a long time. And there were parents who were, one famous case of a couple of uh, three cousins in Philadelphia who, student of Lila Gleitman's, worked on it. Uh, three cousins who played together, little kids who played together. They were, three were deaf. Their parents were 
so indoctrinated that they didn't even gesture to the kids because they didn't want them to be misled into developing signs. Uh, so when the kids were discovered, it turned out that they were chattering to each other in a sign language, which is a, at the expected level of development for a three-year-old, you know, four-year-old. Uh, same structures, and everything the same. So they'd essentially invented their own language out of no data. Actually, this had been noticed much earlier by uh, Eric Lenneberg, who one of the, you know, the person who really founded modern biology of language. He was a fellow. We were friends back in grad school. And at the time, he was uh, interested in uh, language deficiencies. So he went, one of the things he did was visit the school for the deaf, the famous school for the deaf and blind in Boston, Perkins Academy. He went just to observe, see what's going on. And they were all strictly oralist. You know, that was the dogma. Uh, but he noticed that if the teacher turned to the blackboard, the kids would start signing to each other, <laughs> like the kind of things that kids do if the teacher isn't looking. And obviously, they had developed their own sign language and were just using it when they weren't under control. Well, you know, in those days, you couldn't publish anything like this because it was so counter to everything anyone believed. Uh, so it never got published. But uh, uh, since then, when the topics become you know, legitimate, there's other discussions like that. Now, let's take the case of somebody who has no input at all, okay? There are a couple, that's the, the wolf boy case. Well, the chances are very strong that the language capacity would never develop, but that's normal. I mean, take, say, the visual capacity. Remember, in the case of vision, we can study cats and monkeys, and we know what happens. So if you take, say, a kitten and uh, in the first few weeks of life, it's deprived of structured uh, visual stimuli. So like it has a ping pong ball over its eye and all it gets is diffuse light, but nothing structured. Then the uh, neurological basis for uh, uh, analyzing visual uh, systems just degenerates. It's not even there anymore, so they're never going to learn how to see. And that's true of just about every capacity. They tend to have what are called critical periods, you know, periods in which the capacity has to develop or it'll never develop. And um, again, we don't do experiments with humans, but if you did, you'd probably find that there are indirect evidence to indicate that there are several critical periods in which if there's if the system is not stimulated somehow, it's not going to function. I mean, most of us have an experience with this for almost all adults. There are individual differences. But for most adults, it's extremely hard to learn a second language. Uh, infants do it reflexively. And a 10-year-old will do it reflexively. But for older people, it's, it's work. I mean, if one of you were to go to a foreign country with your 10-year-old child, uh, you would discover that in a couple of weeks the kid is jabbering fluently and, you're, and he doesn't care. Maybe the kid doesn't even want to be there, uh, that experience. Uh, but they just can't help it. They just learn the speak the language like a sponge. Uh, on the other hand, the adult can study and take classes and work hard on it. But it's not easy. And probably some critical period has been passed. Uh, there is one case that's been actually studied carefully of uh, a girl who's called Jeannie. If you look it up in the literature, G-E-N-I-E. You have to be careful about the literature because there's a lot of popular literature on it, which is pure garbage. Uh, but there's also some technical papers. There's a woman named uh, Susan Curtis, a very good cognitive neuroscientist who worked with Jeannie, and her papers tell the story straight. Uh, what happened with Jeannie is that she was found when she was, I think, 13 years old. Uh, she was up in an attic uh, tied to a chair. Uh, her, you know, some psychotic parents, and uh, they uh, would shove food in occasionally. She could pick up the food and eat it. Uh, but she had no, they, deprived, they tried to deprive her of any uh, external stimuli. Uh, 
so nobody ever spoke to her, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, when she was found, of course, she was rescued, and there were efforts to try to help her. And Susan Curtis is the, was the therapist, actually, who took care of her. And uh, she, it looked for a while, they were, among other things, it, she turned out to be quite bright. She could learn all kinds of things. And she was, uh, she learned very quickly how to delude people. You know, she was apparently very manipulative. She could make people think she was doing all kinds of things which she wasn't doing. And uh, for a while they thought that she was acquiring language. Uh, but it turned out uh, to be an illusion. Uh, she was acquiring ways of deluding the people around her into thinking she could use language. Uh, but with closer analysis it turned out she could over, overcome that barrier. Now you can't really be sure what that means because a kid who's been raised in those circumstances is going to be totally psychotic. So naturally, so how much of this is just general psychosis and how much is deterioration of the language faculty, you can't tell. Uh, to do that, you'd have to do invasive experiments of the kind that you can imagine, but we can't do. Uh, so it's, that's the kind, actually there's another kind of evidence that is quite interesting. Uh, there's never been, uh, uh, let's say, take Helen Keller, okay? Uh, Helen Keller was uh, blind and deaf very fluent, you know, she's a wonderful writer, you know, all kind of interesting ideas, and no difficulty in expressing herself. She learned what's claimed is that she learned by touch, okay, her teacher, Aunt Sullivan, you know, spelled out words in her hand. It's recently been discovered from photographs from that period that Helen Keller actually had invented a technique that is now using, used for teaching the deaf-blind. The technique is to put a hand on the face and uh, your thumb is on the vocal cord so you can tell if the vocal cords are moving and your fingers on the face, you can see the way the face is moving. So you get a minimal amount of data. But now that's been studied, actually my wife worked on that at MIT and uh, uh, there are uh, subjects who've learned this system who are pretty fluent. Uh, they, not, nobody's ever reached the Helen Keller level, but it's pretty fluent, which is pretty amazing itself because there's almost no data. However, there's something else that was discovered, and there were too few cases to publish anything about it, but the few cases that worked, they found that uh, every case that was successful, the person had lost sight and hearing uh, after about 16 months, 18 months old. Uh, the, the, what happened, the, these are cases of spinal meningitis. Now it's cur curable, so it doesn't happen anymore. But uh, uh, the, it, where, where there was sudden loss of both uh, speech and hearing, hearing and sight. And uh, if they were more than roughly that age, uh, then they could gain fair facility. And Helen Keller was 20 months old when she lost sight and hearing, and uh, she gained, you know, perfect fluency. Before that, there weren't any successful cases. Well, that suggests something. It suggests that by, say, 18 months old, kid already knows the whole language. They're not exhibiting the knowledge, but anyone who's paid attention to children know that they know a lot more than they can exhibit. You know, they're understanding all kinds of things, and they don't seem to be able to do anything. Uh, and it's perfectly possible that uh, by, say, that age, the child has actually acquired the major aspects of language and that the Tadoma the method that I mentioned is just kind of eliciting it, you know, eliciting something that's already inside. Now again, if you could do direct experiments with humans, you could test this. But of course we can't, so you have to look at indirect evidence. But that's, I think the evidence points in that direction. Thank you. Uh, Jamal? Uh, uh, my name is Jamal Rohana. I'm at Linguistics in the city. Uh, I have many technical questions I would like to ask you, but uh, if I could uh, <coughs> ask one general question. Since language is hierarchical, and uh, 
system of externalization is linear, then there is, of course, a non-trivial question of how you convert a hierarchical system into a linear system. Yeah. I was wondering if you could say a few words about that. That's a good question. And, uh, uh, I didn't hear who you were, I'm sorry. But is your background linguistics? Yes. Well, then you know the answer. I mean, that's, <laughs> there's a lot of work on it, like Richie Kane's work on LCA, for example. Uh, all of the, there are various ideas about how a structured system can be mapped into a linear system and what are the principles that do it. And there's some quite interesting ideas, pretty far reaching. Uh, but it's a real problem, it's a real question. And it's only been asked in recent years because you know, the, it was only recognized to be a problem in recent years. Now, if you go back to Saussure and Bloomfield and you know, the great modern linguists, uh, they didn't see it as a problem. Uh, they, uh, so for Saussure, it's all association. You know? And uh, in fact, Saussurean linguistics didn't have a concept of sentence. Uh, sentences somewhere in a boundary between uh, Long and Paol, you know, it doesn't fit anywhere. Uh, for Bloomfield, the uh, language is just uh, uh, the collection of expressions that can be used in a speech community, the same as for Quine, and uh, it doesn't mean anything. But as long as you look at the problems that way, which is pretty much like the, like scholastic physics, you know, sympathies and antipathies uh, going to your natural place, then you're never going to see any problems. It's when you start asking what it means for, uh, uh, what kind of a set is it that's the expressions that can be used in a speech community, when you start asking those questions that everything suddenly becomes very puzzling, including this question, which is a very live one today. You know, what is, you know, it raises all kinds of questions like, uh, uh, how do Japanese and English uh, yield linear order when they seem to have opposite structural orders? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there were two questions there, Paul. Uh, Hi, um, so I'm Paul, I'm a student at Trinity. So uh, I agree with you in sort of the rejection of this dogma of having externalization of use as prior to thought. But, and that also opens up sort of an interesting avenue for now we have to think of a new way to have semantic interpretation. Of semantic interpretation? Yeah, right, because now we have to leave sort of the, the standard view of having we, what we're looking for are sort of the objects of the educational acts and so on. Now, one person who sort of also shared this view would be Jerry Fodor. Though he's sort of been, he's been saying sort of in a couple of places lately that he finds your views on semantics puzzling is the word that he chooses. And the, sort of the, la the last decade he's been trying to say, well, the way to go about is by having informational semantics and then try to find some causal relation between the outside world and the mental representations. I mean, you've been emphasizing a couple of places that mental representation doesn't require mental representation of. I know that you've been saying a couple of days that mental representation doesn't require mental representation of something. And I agree with that too. But I still share something about sort of further puzzlement that at some point we have to have some thoughts have to have a balance, and they have to be about something at some point. So if Foda finds your views puzzling, what do you think about his approach to do this? Well, we're old friends for 50 years and we found each other's views puzzling for 50 years. <laughs> in fact, uh, it's reciprocal. In fact, when I mentioned uh, about cows and the word cow, I had Jared Fodor in mind. Uh, his view is, you know, you know his view. He says he, exactly what I said. A child sees a cow, somebody says cow, uh, that sets up the connection. And from then on, the sight of the cow causes causal relation of the mental image, image or notion or whatever it is, cow. And that simply does not stand up to examination. As soon as you begin to look at words, incidentally, this was pretty well understood in the 17th century. So if you read the uh, Locke, uh, Hume, uh, you know, the English Platonists, others, uh, they understood that uh, 
the our our, our concept, if you like, if uh, of an object is not uh, individuated by identifiable physical properties. So you read Locke on person, for example. He says persons. He, he didn't put in these terms, but what he if you look at the kind of thought experiments Locke carried out with what if you have two minds in the same body, that kind of thing. What he's actually saying is that our concept of person is based on some notion like psychic continuity. Okay, psychic continuity is not a physical property. It's not something a physicist can discover. It's something that uh, we're imposing on the world. It's like the rigidity principle. In fact, for Locke, uh, he says person is what he calls a forensic concept. It carries with it notions like responsibility and rights. Well, you know, physicists can't look at an object and say, OK, he has responsibility and rights. Uh, actually, there's a, uh, this is known in the history of philosophy. There's a recent book on it by Galen Strawson, who uh, brings up these things. He unfortunately doesn't refer to the history about them because nobody knows it. But uh, the uh, but that's correct, and and that's just true of everything, including cows. Uh, so you can quickly make up simple thought experiments that show that notions like cow are, are also based on psychic continuity, among other properties. In fact, there's some uh, part of this that's very familiar to everyone. Uh, fairy tales. Uh, infants have no problem understanding fairy tales. Uh, it's easy, you know, but uh, just think of the standard fairy tale. You know, the uh, wicked witch uh, uh, casts a spell on the uh, handsome prince and turns, turns him into a frog, let's say. And for the rest of the story, the, the prince has all the physical properties of a frog, all of them. Uh, then the beautiful princess kill, kisses the frog and becomes the handsome prince again. That means it always was the prince, didn't matter what its physical characteristics were, uh, because it's uh, uh, because what makes it a person is uh, this strange property of psychic continuity that runs through the whole thing. Always, is. and you can do the same. There's similar stories with animals, you know, turned into something and then turned back into themselves and so on. And uh, children have no problems with that. That's uh, uh, perfectly straightforward because their concepts are simply not based on physical properties. Um, of course, in part they are. Like uh, you don't distinguish, you know, say a, a cow and a, a, a house or something. But uh, it's only a small part of it. Uh, most of our concepts, even of the simplest notions, are pretty much like the rigidity principle. You see them a certain way because of the way you interpret the world, and you can't get that by association and causality. Uh, so I think Jerry's approach is, uh, and every, it's not just him, everyone's, is uh, uh, hopeless from the start. In fact, I think if you look closely, uh, you, I think you find that in human language, uh, there really is no referent, no notion of reference or denotation. Uh, there's. Uh, you know, ways of interpreting the world based on our internal conceptual systems, but they do not set up a relationship between an internal symbol, like a word, and some mind-independent entity, which was what reference or denotation would have to be. And in fact, if you look at the history of philosophy, uh, uh, some of the famous conundrums have to do with this. Uh, so take, say, the ship of Theseus, you know, a Plutarch story. The story is that uh, Theseus is on a ship in the ocean and uh, there's a variant of it. And he, uh, one of the boards rots, and throws the board overward, overboard, replaces it by a different board. Uh, this keeps going until finally every board has been replaced. and. Uh, uh, it's still the ship of Theseus, although all the physical properties have changed. Well, the, the conundrum comes when you add, say, that there's somebody on the shore 
who's picking up the old boards and putting them back together and uh, rebuilds the original ship. Uh, which one is the ship of Theseus? Uh, nobody has an answer. Uh, we just, our, and the reason is our cognitive systems are not designed so they can deal with a question like that. Uh, actually, I, I tried this out with my a ridiculously small sample of my grandchildren once. Uh, they made me watch some space program, you know, Star Trek or something, where they have a, this device on the spaceship in which a person can go into it and be transported somehow, reconstructed on another planet. Okay, so nobody has any problem with that. Uh, but then. I asked them uh, what would happen if the person who was reconstructed on the other planet was still in the box that he went into. Which one would be the person? That's the ship of Theseus. Uh, they were kind of stuck with that. They thought about it, had different answers, but basically had no answer. And uh, uh, I think if you look at Kripke's puzzle, it's pretty much the same. Uh, the puzzle dissolves if you don't assume that there is an entity a mind-independent entity that words like uh, London or Paderewski and so on are referring to. But if there is no such relation in language, then the puzzle can't be formulated. And uh, of course, there are going to be questions you can't answer, like uh, which is the, you know, which is the ship or who's the per which is the person in the box. But there's no reason why you should be able to answer them. Uh, why should our cognitive systems be? developed so that any question you come up with, we have an intuitive answer to. No, they're not. No, those are the traditional puzzles. And to find out why they're unanswerable, we have to look into the nature of our conceptual systems. And I think it's here that uh, ideas like, say, Jerry's uh, just found her right at the beginning. Because there are no, there is no way of, um, try any, just about any word you can think of, no matter how simple, uh, you'll find that uh, it, it, it's, the concept is individuated by non-physical properties. Actually, this was noticed by Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle talks about it, uh, he talks about it in metaphysical terms. So he asks, uh, uh, what's a house? You know, uh, what's the definition of house? He's not doesn't say the definition of the word house, the definition of the thing. This is in the metaphysics. Uh, and he says the definition of house is a combination of matter and form. Okay, so the matter is, uh, you know, boards and bricks and stuff like that. And the form is what it's used for, uh, what the design is, uh, things like that, which are, you know, this was all later reconstructed in the 17th century. And, epistemological terms, these are this the cognitive structures uh, without Aristotle's metaphysics anymore of matter and form. But uh, I think the basic idea is right, that uh, uh, what uh, constitutes a concept for us is some combination of you know, things we perceive and uh, constructions that we impose on it by our complicated cognitive systems for which things like psychic continuity and design and use and so on are critical. Now, if there's something that looks like a house, say, but it's used uh, to, uh, to store books, it's a library, it's not a house. And this holds of every term you can think of, uh, river, tree, almost everything, maybe everything, everything that's been looked at. Ashley. Uh, hi, um, I'm Ashley Green from Trinity College Dublin. Um, so you, you started off, you know, you start off with sort of, uh, some science of meaning, and this is really interesting. And and then you part, you, you sort of, you know, part of your explanation for this is that there are certain semantic structures in the head, and one of the things that drops out of your view is that um, while communication is a use of language, it's not an essential function of language. But I was wondering on your view whether um, you think that communication can become essential 
when we've got kind of other people involved. So when when human beings want to cooperate with each other, it might turn out that say when I see someone's facial expression as a smile and it's meaningful, and I say, and, and then I ask myself, well, are they smiling at me because you know um, they agree with what I'm saying, or perhaps they're smiling at me because they think what I'm saying is slightly ridiculous, or there are all these possibilities um, um, for how I interpret how I interpret their smile, how I interpret their their smile, and so then it becomes. Um, essential for me to kind of talk to them and ask them, is this what you mean by your smile or what you're saying or perhaps your your you know this piece of writing? Um, if you know once we once there are other people around who we want to cooperate with and we want to understand, it can become uh, language can then become essential. Well, here you're using what do they mean in Paul Grice's sense? Yeah. Or what do they intend? Yeah. It's not really meaning, it's intention. Yeah. Uh, he tried to unite them, but I don't think that worked. Okay. But here it's a clear case. That's normal in interaction with other people, you, or even what you read. You try to figure out what's intended. You don't pay much attention to the literal meaning of the expression. I mean, of course, that gives you a hint, but uh, mm -hmm. you're really trying to figure out what's going on in the person's mind. What are they trying to convey? Yeah. And uh, that's... Uh, pretty tricky operation, as you know, but then a lot of things come into play, you know, background assumptions, uh, where the person's coming from intellectually, you know, what are your shared beliefs, uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a complicated uh, social action, which of course takes place all the time, and a language is part of it, uh, but uh, notice that the literal meaning of expressions, well, as you say, is only one piece of the puzzle. I mean, you, if the person's talking Swahili, you can't do this. Uh, but if the person's talking English, a language you know, uh, you can instinctively and reflexively, you know, no thought, uh, grasp the literal meaning. And that's one factor in, that enters into your trying to determine what the intention is. Uh, but the kinds of things I was talking about just are the stuff that's going on reflexively, the literal meaning. And there, that has quite interesting properties. And I think even the look at the literal meaning uh, shows that communication and other language uses are uh, peripheral to the system. Doesn't mean they're unimportant, just maybe they're very important for human life. Uh, incidentally, I think communication is a pretty bad word for this kind of social interaction. I mean, if communication is supposed to have some meaning, it has to do with transmission of information. But most of our interaction with other people isn't transmission of information. Like, you know, you're talking to somebody at a party, let's say, or you're not trying to transmit information, like you're doing all kinds of things. Uh, or you're standing at a, it's very hard for people to be near each other and not to talk if you want to, really embarrass people, uh, put them in a closed room and uh, ask them not to talk to each other. I mean, it's, it's very threatening. You just can't do it, you know. Uh, try it sometimes. <laughs> so you're kind of forced to talk to the people. You know, at a bus stop, you talk to the person who's next to you. But uh, it's, you're not conveying information. You're just maintaining some kind of uh, social interaction that's comfortable. So I don't think it should be, even those things should be called communication. It's, uh, again, the, the idea of using communication comes from this kind of instrumentalist approach to this study of uh, psychology and sociology. Everything has to be for some you know, purpose or something, well, the, the, to achieve something. But most of our use of language, even with other people, isn't achieving anything more than maintaining a, pleasant uh, social conditions, you know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. So there are two questions uh, here, the lady in the second row. Um, Hi, my name is Edna Gilfoyle, Dublin City University. Uh, I'm a linguist. <laughs> 
Uh, I'd like to ask a question about modularity of mind and some of the ideas that you're uh, speaking about here, in particular the structural properties of the linguistic system. Is that specific to the linguistic system or do you think that's related to other parts of the cognitive system? That's my first question. The second one is a bit, I guess, maybe, maybe more trivial, but for those individuals who don't have language for whatever reason, who fail to develop, is there a cognitive uh, impairment as well, would you see that? Is, is that there a cognitive effect? impairment as well as a consequence? Like, how related are those two things? Well, um, first of all, about modularity, we have to make a distinction between two interpretations of that concept. Uh, the one that's in common use, actually, is Jerry, Jerry Fodor's, uh, is uh, he's talking about modularity of processing systems. So it's the input systems that are modular, he's arguing. Uh, and it would have to be extended to output systems, of course. Uh, according to him, the, what he calls the central systems have to be uh, uh, unstructured, quine and isotropic. You know? So there can't be any structure to the input systems. Uh, that does set up a problem. So for example, why do you uh, hear English and speak English. Why don't you hear English and speak Japanese? I mean, if the systems are unconnected, uh, why is that the case? Uh, well, uh, there has to be structure for the in, for the central systems. And here you get a different notion of modularity, a notion of modularity that's more related to acquisition than processing. So, given all the noise and confusion around you. How do things get sorted out into different systems? Well, that's where the internal system of modularity arises, and I think that's where your question comes. So what are the connections between, if any, between the internal linguistic system and other cognitive systems? Uh, it's, it's an interesting question, and the way to, uh, there are other, um, languages, uh, you, uh, every, group of humans that's ever been discovered has essentially the same same kind of language. But there are other uh, there are other common properties that are found, uh, like music. Uh, just about I think every society that's known, you know, uncontacted, uh, uh, so-called primitive, you know, hunter-gatherer tribes, they, they they always have some kind of music, you know, drumming, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, I think they almost always have dance. That seems to be universal. Uh, these things just have no function at all. You know, like what's dance for? But uh, children pick it up instantly, uh, kind of automatically. Uh, every society has it. And you could ask the question whether uh, another thing that every known society has is arithmetical capacity. Now, that, there's a lot of misleading information about that. Now, it's often claimed that uh, you know, aboriginal groups don't have arithmetic, uh, but that's based on the fact that they don't have number words, or they may have number words that only go to three or four or something. Uh, but uh, this was studied carefully by a really outstanding linguist, uh, Ken Hale, about 40 years ago. He's one of the founders of Australian linguistics, and he did study languages which don't have number words. Uh, but he found that uh, the people, first of all, they have other ways of expressing numbers. Like maybe they don't have the word five, but they can go like that, and uh, other ways of doing it. He also found that if these people are introduced into a market system, you know, they start selling and buying, they can do all the computations immediately. So they must have the whole number system. And the same appears to be true about color systems. Like a lot of the systems is well known that you know, there are languages that don't have color words sometimes beyond black and white. Uh, but as he found with the Australian Aboriginal groups, uh, they have other ways of expressing it. So they may not have red, but they can say blood-like. You know? And uh, uh, so the whole conceptual system all seems to be there. The arithmetic is particularly interesting because uh, where that comes from is, is an old problem. 
actually that goes back to the origins of evolutionary theory. So Darwin and Wallace uh, puzzled about the fact that uh, all humans, they, they didn't know all the data, but they were right, that all humans have uh, arithmetical capacity. And uh, that's a puzzle for them because it wasn't selected. It's never been used. So there was no selection. In fact, the, using the arith arithmetical system is very recent and very restricted to small groups of people, but everybody's got it. So where did it come from? Uh, Wallace, in fact, thought that there has to be some other uh, uh, process in evolution beyond natural selection. Uh, Darwin didn't like that, so they debated it. Uh, what, what I think the answer in all these cases has to be that these things are kind of piggybacking on systems that are already there for some reason. In the case of arithmetic, if you look closely at language design, at the computational, the elementary computational principles that enter into the generative procedure, they actually yield arithmetic. If you take those procedures and you take a system with one element in the lexicon, call it one, it yields arithmetic. So it could, arithmetic just could be uh, you know, piggybacking on the system that's already there. But what about music? There is work, um, some interesting work, trying to sh show that the basic properties of musical systems uh, are similar to the structural properties of linguistic systems. There's quite interesting work on that, and maybe that'll come out. Uh, dance, you could try this. Actually, Nelson Goodman tried to do something <coughs> with dance. But uh, I think these are really good questions because you have to ask where do these things come from? In the case of language, uh, we have no idea where it came from, but you can imagine a way in which it could have evolved suddenly, some slight rewiring of the brain, and maybe the other things just spin off it. Or maybe there's some other origin. That's a good question. But in order to study it, you have to accept the notion of modularity that is not used in the philosophical literature. Not input modularity, but rather central modularity. And that's what's explicitly denied by Fodor and implicitly denied quite generally. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Chomsky. I'm a, I'm a student of linguistics in UCD in my third year. Um, one of the things is when you mentioned the, the cow, it, I was suddenly reminded I went to a coffee shop but just before I arrived here and somebody's looking for the toilet door and they were indicated to a, to a bookshelf that is a door, and so in a sense I'm surrounded by toilet doors in here, it's a beautiful building. So that idea that what a door is it assumed to be, that it looks like something else but still functions yeah. as, as a door. As a function, the door is a door. Is yeah. To your cow. yeah. Um, but I was interested as well in uh, the idea, I believe it was a student of yours before, of the cost conceptual metaphors. Um, and the manner in which we should use or think about language in how it presents ideas of uh, the cost, for example, of conflating to rising prices, etc. And to, in the manner as well that that has almost become a way in which ideas are espoused through political systems. So the Republican says so the father figure, etc., that type of idea. So at what point do, does language then, should we think of language as a, a way of producing thought? as an interaction with the mind, and then a, a system of communication that's used to, to present ideas that go beyond what we think about. Um, I don't quite have that question straight in my own head. But can something like a conceptual metaphor uh, be reflective of a thought process, or is it all the other way around? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, there are what sound like serious questions about whether language depends on thought or thought depends on language. But in order to study those questions, you have to clarify what you mean by language and what you mean by thought. And the fact is there's very little to say about thought except insofar as thought is expressed in language, which undercuts the investigation. We have to find a way to uh, think about thought that's language independent. And that's not easy. 
I mean, you could do it in other domains, like you know, imagery, visual domains. How do you find your way home at night? Things like that. Well, it's some kind of thought. A lot of it can't be expressed in language. But uh, this is no theory of thought. And until there's a kind of some kind of a theory of thought that's independent of language, it's going to be very, very hard to even pose the questions. So it's a, it's a traditional question, and, and but it's one of those questions which. I don't think we're in a position to formulate because we don't understand what we mean by thought. Uh, this is where the misinterpretations of Turing play a role. Uh, so, so good questions. I just don't know how they can be form formulated yet. So I think we have time for one more question. Paul Elburn. Maybe, Paul, you will introduce yourself, even though I mentioned you. Well, name. since Maria has just already done that. Uh, 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 so um, um, I work at uh, Queen Mary Mesfield College um, in, um, um, in uh, London. Um, I'd like to ask you, Noam, uh, about uh, something that you said in response to a question, a couple of questions back, uh, namely about um, words not having real world uh, a reference. Um, and, um, um, I, I suppose what I'd like to, to uh, point out is that uh, some of those cases seem to be cases that are not accessible or not easily accessible um, um, to uh, consciousness. So, for example, the word house, you pointed out all these strange features of it, both now and in your writings, but I, I think it really takes you know, someone to point out those kinds of features before people uh, realize them. With other examples, though, um, I think the the oddness, or you know, the let's just say the fact that these phrases don't have real world reference, seems more easily accessible. So, for example, another uh, sentence um, of yours, um, I think it goes something like, um, "The bank moved across the road after burning down," yeah. which seems at first like a perfectly straightforward sentence in English. We can all more or less reconstruct the train of of events, but then when you reflect on it for just a second, you think, huh, that's funny, you know, there can be nothing, no real object can have A burned down and then moved across the road, which is the point yeah. of the example. So, so my question is, um, at least for the latter kind of examples, um, how is it that we are able to use those sentences so easily to convey a truth? Because it seems on first inspection at least that, you know, if a sentence either asserts or presupposes the existence of an object that, that does not exist, and indeed in many of these cases uh, an object um, that could not exist, it seems on first inspection like they should either just uh, come out false or that they should come out as, you know, uh, presupposition failures. Actually, I should mention that Paul is the only person who writes on somatics who takes any of this seriously, so it's, <laughs> it's unique. Uh, but uh, I think what it means is just that most of what we do is unreflective. It's, uh, it's kind of like uh, seeing a rigid object in motion when there's, or seeing the moon illusion or uh, understanding other people. We have the slightest idea how we do it. Uh, we can't introspect into our own behavior, uh, any more than we can introspect into uh, falling bodies. I mean, it's just intuitively obvious that if you have two, two objects of different mass, uh, the one with uh, uh, a larger mass is going to fall faster. Well, this turns out to be false. But it's, uh, if we can't introspect into something as simple as, uh, say, falling bodies, or why some things fall and others rise. Now, how can we hope to introspect into anything as complicated as what the human mind is doing? You've got to study it from the outside, the way you study other things. And when you do, it's very hard. Uh, there are illusions about, one of the main illusions in the, go through all of intellectual history is that somehow the uh, ourse we ourselves ought to be the easiest thing to study because we can look into what's going on. So, say, you know, Tom Nagel asks uh, what it's like to be a bat. 
and uh, nobody can give the answer. But try answering the question, what it's like to be me. I mean, I don't think anybody can answer that question either. At least I can't. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you, just, you can't pose questions like that. Uh, they, they don't mean anything. Uh, we, uh, to, to figure out what it's like to be me, or a bat, or a, um, you know, a nematode, or no matter how simple it is, is a hard scientific question. And to ask what it's like to be a person, even yourself, is maybe the, one of the hardest questions. You can write novels about it, or write poetry about it or something, but uh, you can't give a discursive account. Just you can't answer the question. Uh, and uh, I think we can't hope to answer the kinds of questions that you're talking about just by introspection. Somehow when people use the word bank, let's say, they automatically understand what you just brought out. And uh, they don't find it confusing unless you point out to them, look, this doesn't, technically doesn't make any sense. And then you get things like, say, Kripke's puzzles. Uh, but the puzzles arise because you're trying to, uh, to uh, present in a rational form uh, that's you know, somehow objective uh, things that are handled by people in a totally different way. If I may ask uh, a Sure. Paul? Yeah, go ahead. So he, I guess he gets a special dispensation. No, he he gets, takes yeah, Paul seriously. gets special yeah. dispensation. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess my worry is that, um, um, you know, does this commit us to the existence of um, two systems that are capable of analyzing sentences like that? Um, there's, um, you know, the, the uh, I guess the normal semantic interpretation system, which is indeed inaccessible um, um, to, um, to um, consciousness, as you say, uh, um, but then there's this other faculty by which we come along and say, that's, mm, right. that's funny. Yeah. But it seems that this other faculty is itself doing some kind of semantic analysis yeah. of those sentences. And so we seem to be left with a kind of, what words from the, you know, on the face of it look like a slightly uh, ontologically costly system, whereby we have two systems that can do some kind of semantic analysis. Well, I think, I think we have to set up two different systems. There's our many different systems. In fact, I think there's a, probably a high level of modularity in the mind. Uh, one of our capacities, we call it a science-forming capacity, uh, which every one every has in some fashion is to try to make sense of our experience in a coherent way. I mean, uh, Russell once pointed out that the only thing we're really confident about is our own immediate experience. And the rest of inquiry, including all of science, is to try to give some coherent account of what this experience is. And I think that's basically right. Uh, this science-forming capacity, which uh, children use to make sense of the world, the primitive tribes use, and so on, is, uh, is just a different one. It's also trying to make sense of the use of language. Uh, so, for example, when you, uh, a, a child, let's say, if present you in a, a Piagetian type experiment where you know, something moves and something else moves, uh, the child will automatically set up a a con an invisible contact between them. You know, there's got to be some invisible mechanical thing that's causing them to interact. Because that's just the way we see the world. Uh, that, in fact, that's a, a major event in the history of science. It was when Newton showed that it doesn't work. When he uh, uh, demonstrated that the, what was called then the mechanical philosophy, the assumptions about the nature of the world that were made by every great scientist, you know, Galileo, Leibniz, Descartes, Huygens, everyone, and Newton himself, he believed it. Uh, that's why he regarded his discoveries an absurdity that no person with any scientific understanding could pay any attention to, but it just happened to be true, uh, that uh, you can't have uh, a mechanical universe, uh, that you have uh, what he and others regarded as a kind of occult property, a uh, action without contact it can't happen. And 
our intuitive way of understanding the world just happens to be different from the way the world appears when we apply our science forming capacities to it. Uh, that was a wrenching moment. You know, in fact, uh, it changed the whole nature of science. So for Galileo, the great scientist of the early modern period, uh, the goal of science was to show that the world is intelligible. Uh, Post-Newton, it changed. It took a long time for it to sink in, but basically changed. We give up the hope of understanding the world. We just try to understand theories about the world, which is totally different. Uh, that's, and you get you know, uh, apparent contradictions, like Hume, who understood this, uh, uh, pointed out that Newton's greatest achievement was to show that uh, there are mysteries which we will never comprehend. Uh, he was referring to things like action without contact, interaction without contact. On the other hand, you get modern scientists and philosophers like uh, David Deutsch, uh, David Abraham, many others, uh, in fact, generally, who condemn what's called mysterianism. That is, the, uh, that, that is, there are things that we cannot comprehend. That's Dan Dennett, lots of others. This is uh, some kind of pathology, because in principle, we can understand anything. Well, what they're claiming is something quite, uh, they have already internalized the change of the conception of science from trying to discover an intelligible world given up by the time Newton's discoveries sank in uh, to trying to discover intelligible theories. And maybe we can de develop an intelligible theory about anything, every, you know, about almost anything, maybe anything you can think of. But that doesn't mean that the world's going to be intelligible. So mysterianism just almost has to be true. I think it was proven by uh, Newton, in fact, though he didn't like it. He thought it was absurd. Uh, Hume recognized it, recognized, look, it's true. What can we do with it? Uh, Locke recognized it. So Locke, you know, uh, uh, one of his great insights was, you know, what's called Locke's suggestion in the history of philosophy that uh, he said that just as there are, he put it the theological framework, but we can extract it from that. Uh, what he said is just as God added to matter uh, properties which we cannot comprehend, like action at a distance, uh, so God might have super added to matter uh, a faculty of thinking. It's the hypothesis of thinking matter, which was then it kind of opened up the possibility of of really having a scientific psychology has kind of dropped for a couple of centuries, but that's it, basically. Uh, and you have to try to figure out, well, what is the property of whatever's in there that uh, uh, allows thinking? But I think that gets right back to your question. Uh, we can, with our scientific capacities, we can look at this and say, hey, there's something really wrong here. We have to have another a system for describing it which doesn't have these internal contradictions. And that's just a different system than uh, what we call common sense or ordinary ways of looking at things. And within the, that system, you can develop, in fact, you try to develop a notion of reference. So in, say, physics or linguistics or any other uh, kind of organized inquiry, you, you hope that the entities that you construct, mental entities that you construct, symbolic entities, you hope that they uh, actually pick out something that exists in the world. So if you scientists think they found the Higgs boson, uh, they would like to believe that there is a Higgs boson out there. You know? And uh, if uh, linguists talk about phonemes, they'd like to say, yeah, there's something real that's a phoneme. Uh, but that's a totally different notion from the ones in our ordinary language. In fact, this leads to a lot of problems in contemporary philosophy, I think. Like, take the whole twin earth discussions, uh, or the idea that, you know, the water is H2O, and all of those discussions. They're just mixing up two different systems. Uh, you can't ask whether water is H2O in natural language, say English, because it doesn't have the word H2O. 
That's from another system. You can't ask whether water is H2O in chemistry because it doesn't have the word water. Um, of course, chemists use it informally, but they have H2O and not water. There's no, if you actually look at what water is in human language, it's a very complex notion. Uh, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with H2O, of course. But uh, so even, you can't even pose the questions that are discussed in the twin earth literature because of mixing two quite distinct systems. And it's kind of curious because the, the philosophers who develop these systems believe something that you know, comes from Quine and Wittgenstein and so on, that, you can, that words don't have meaning except inside a language. Okay. Well, if you believe that, then if you mix up two, two languages, it's going to be incoherent. You know? And uh, so you'll get what looks like a sentence, water is H2O. But water is getting its meaning from English, and H2O is getting its meaning from chemistry. And chemistry is a system which at least strives to have reference. That's the whole point of science. And English is a system that doesn't strive to do anything. It's just, it's just like uh, walking. It's what it is. That it doesn't happen to have reference. So, thank you very much. We not only have used uh, all the time allocated to this session, but have gone beyond it. And thank you, Professor Chomsky, for your generosity yeah. in answering all the questions. I think the Academy would like officially to make a presentation oh. to you at that stage, and then we'll convey our uh, thanks as a group. I, I would uh, like to thank Professor. Chomsky for this wonderful occasion and thank you for coming and uh, Maria Bagramian and uh, School of Philosophy and UCD for organising it uh, very well. This is a book of our treasures uh, oh. in the Academy. Uh, oh. Many of them are actually here but also we have many treasures which are in the national uh, museums and, and so on. Uh, and uh, you will be uh, interested that so much of it has to do with natural philosophy oh. as, as it's called it, early chemistry and so on but uh, there are very many beautiful things and we're very proud to be able to say thank you. Well thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Try it sometime. Think about what you're actually doing when you talk to your, what you call talking to yourself. I think you'll find that what you're actually, what, what's actually in your mind consciously is just fragments. Uh, little fragments flit by. And out of those fragments, you can suddenly construct a sentence, uh, uh, a, a meaningful sentence. And uh, that meaningful sentence is some, probably being constructed unconsciously, beyond the level of consciousness, internally, by whatever these generative processes are. And bits and pieces of it reach consciousness, like a couple of fragments of phrases. And that's what we call thinking to ourselves. And by now, that's, uh, you know, that, that seems to be true in other domains, too. There's some, by now, famous experiments, the Libet experiments on uh, uh, decision making, which have been widely misinterpreted. Uh, but what was found was that if you decide to do something, say, I decide to pick this up, uh, milliseconds before I decide, uh, something's going on in the motor areas, uh, namely the, the right you know, organization of motion to pick it up. Well, you know, the immediate conclusion was, that was drawn from this is, okay, that shows there's no freedom of will. It doesn't show anything of the sort. Uh, what it shows is that everything that's going on is beyond the level of consciousness, uh, which we know in every other domain too. But as long as philosophy of mind is going to be bound by this dogma that you can't go beyond what's available to consciousness or else it's not in the mind. It's never going to discover anything, uh, And I, I think. And, and there's a whole collection, and I think that dogma too probably goes back to behaviorism. I mean, it's pretty clear in Quine's case. It's uh, Quine, you may remember, distinguishes. Uh, it says actions can be in accord with principles or guided by principles. That's all. Uh, in accord with principles means like the planets following Kepler's laws. You know. uh, it, guided by principles means 
you formulate what you're going to do and then you do it. And you say virtually all action doesn't fall in any of those categories, either of those categories. And with John Searle, it comes up as what he calls his association principle. You know, have to have, has to be available to consciousness somehow before it can be attributed to the mind. And a whole spins off a whole theory about rules and so on. Uh, but that's just uh, approaching these questions with your hands tied behind your back. And I think the same is true of the considerations that you mentioned. They're real, but it's very peripheral to, to the use of language. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so does that mean... The two things that are close to each other when you look into the structures. And that's a computational, complex computational problem. On the other hand, it worked the other way, uh, through proximity instead of structural distance, it would be a trivial computational problem. You just check the closest verb to instinctively or to can, and that's the one it's associated with. Now that's elementary, elementary computational problem. But uh, language doesn't use the simple computation. It uses a complex one, which ought to be puzzling, uh, and is puzzling, I think. And in, uh, it's not just true of these examples. It's true of every construction that's known in every language that's known. So there's something far-reaching about it. Uh, well, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the general principle, minimal search, you know, closest distance, that's all over the place in language. And uh, probably it's just uh, kind of a ref uh, effect of the general property of minimal computation that I mentioned. Uh, in this case, there is some supporting evidence from neuroscience, uh, one of the most interesting experimental results in neuroscience has to do exactly with this. Uh, it involved, it's, an exp it's a work done in Milan. Uh, the, for those of you who are linguists, the linguist involved is Andrea Moro, other biologist. Uh, the, uh, they investigated the following paradigm. Take, uh, say, speakers of German and, uh, and give them two nonsense languages, invented languages one of which satisfies the properties of, say, Italian, which they don't know, and the other is designed to violate principles of universal grammar. So in this connection, uh, take an invented language in which the, you negate a sentence by putting the negative particle after the third word, let's say. Uh, language does it in a much more complex way with using structural distance. Well, it turns out that uh, for the case of the nonsense language that satisfies UG principles, you get normal brain activation in the uh, uh, language areas. Uh, for the case that violates UG principles, like having negation as the third word in a sentence, uh, you get a lot of brain activation all over the place, and people can ultimately solve the problem. But it's evident that they're, teaching, they're treating as a puzzle and not as, a, not as a language problem. Uh, there's also some evidence, some of you may know this, from uh, observation of cognitively impaired but uh, linguistically capable subjects uh, about computational efficiency and communicative efficiency and ask uh, how they interrelate. Well, I think uh, considerations of that, that kind, I'll barely have a chance to hint at them, uh, do suggest quite strongly that the traditional view is correct, that language is an instrument of thought informally, and that the modern dogmas uh, about language and communication are just wrong. Uh, communication is, an, an, is a use of language, of course, but there's plenty of other uses as well. Uh, and uh, it's a secondary. It's not really a critical part of language and, and not uh, not particularly specific to language. You can communicate in all kind of other ways. You know, style of dress, uh, you know, how you comb your hair, um, you know, facial expressions, uh, innumerable ways to communicate. Language, of course, is one, but nothing special about the connection. Well, uh, this, uh, uh, these questions began to take a clear form uh, approximately 60 years ago when there were the first serious efforts to try to actually construct uh, 
uh, generative procedures, computational procedures that would meet the minimum condition required, namely uh, a, 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 a pr generating a, an infinite array of unstructured, of structured expressions which have uh, an interpretation in these two uh, interfaces, as they're called, uh, meaning and externalization sound. And as soon as those attempts were made, some very puzzling phenomena were discovered. That's commonly the case. When you begin to look at some topic closely, it turns out that everything you believed was wrong. Actually, that's the classic moment of the origins of modern science. So for millennia, uh, scientists had believed that uh, there are simple answers to the question why uh, if you let go of a rock, it falls, and if you release uh, steam, it rises. Uh, they're going to their natural place. And uh, how do objects interact uh, through sympathies and antipathies? Uh, how do you perceive a triangle? Uh, there's a triangle over there, and a form flits through the air, and gets into your brain, and there's a triangle in there, and so on for a range of questions. Uh, these were the conclusions of the best scientists, literally, for millennia. Uh, when Galileo and others uh, began to be agreed to be puzzled about these phenomena, instead of just accepting them, uh, it immediately turned out that all your intuitions are totally wrong with, well, it goes with swim, not with fly. Or similarly, suppose you raise a question and you ask, uh, can eagles that fly swim? Well, the can goes with swim, not with fly, uh, which is a curious fact because a computational procedure is involved which is quite complex. Uh, there, there is a minimal distance relation that is true of the actual linkage, but it's minimal structural distance. It's distance, it's the closest the two things that are closest to each other when you look into the structures. And that's a computational, complex computational problem. On the other hand, it worked the other way, uh, through proximity instead of structural distance, it would be a trivial computational problem. You just check the closest verb to instinctively or to can, and that's the one it's associated with. And that's elementary, elementary computational problem. But uh, language doesn't use the simple computation. It uses a complex one, which ought to be puzzling, uh, and is puzzling, I think. And in, uh, it's not just true of these examples. It's true of every construction that's known in every language that's known. So there's something far-reaching about it. Uh, well, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the general principle, minimal search, you know, closest distance, that's all over the place in language, and uh, probably it's just uh, kind of a ref uh, effect of the general property of minimal computation that I mentioned. Uh, in this case, there is some supporting evidence from neuroscience. Uh, one of the most interesting experimental results in neuroscience has to do exactly with this. Uh, it involved, it's, an exp it's a work done in Milan. Uh, the, for those of you who are linguists, the linguist involved is Andrea Moro, other biologists. Uh, the, uh, they investigated the following paradigm. Take, uh, say, speakers of German and, uh, and give them two nonsense languages, invented languages, uh, one of which satisfies the properties of, say, Italian, which they don't know, and the other is designed to violate principles of universal grammar. So in this connection, uh, take an invented language in which the, you negate a sentence by putting the negative particle after the third word, let's say. Uh, language does it in a much more complex way with using structural distance. Well, it turns out that uh, for the for the theological framework, but we can extract it from that. Uh, what he says, just as God added to matter uh, properties which we cannot comprehend, like action at a distance, uh, 
so God might have super added to matter uh, a faculty of thinking. It's the hypothesis of thinking matter, which was then it kind of opened up the possibility of, of really having a scientific psychology. It's kind of dropped for a couple of centuries, but that's it, basically. Uh, and you have to try to figure out, well, what is the property of whatever's in there that uh, uh, allows thinking? But I think that gets right back to your question. Uh, we can, with our scientific capacities, we can look at this and say, hey, there's something really wrong here. We have to have another system for describing it which doesn't have these internal contradictions. And that's just a different system than uh, what we call common sense or ordinary ways of looking at things. And within the, that system, you can develop, in fact, you try to develop a notion of reference. So in, say, physics or linguistics or any other uh, kind of organized inquiry, you, you hope that the entities that you construct, mental entities that you construct, symbolic entities, you hope that they actually pick out something that exists in the world. So if you scientists think they found the Higgs boson, they would like to believe that there is a Higgs boson out there, you know. And uh, if uh, linguists talk about phonemes, they'd like to say, you know, there's something real that's a phoneme. Uh, but that's a totally different notion from the ones in our ordinary language. Uh, in fact, this leads to a lot of problems in contemporary philosophy, I think. Like, take the whole twin earth discussions, uh, or the idea that, you know, the water is H2O, and all of those discussions. They're just mixing up two different systems. Uh, you can't ask whether water is H2O in natural language, say English, because it doesn't have the word H2O. That's from another system. You can't ask whether water is H2O in chemistry, because it doesn't have the word water. Um, of course, chemists use it informally, but they have H2O and not water. There's no if you actually look at what water is in human language, it's a very complex notion. Uh, you know, it has nothing to do with H2O, of course. But uh, so even, you can't even pose the questions that are discussed in the Twin Earth literature uh, because of mixing two quite distinct systems. And it's kind of curious to be called communication. It's, uh, Again, the, the idea of using communication comes from this kind of instrumentalist approach to this study of uh, psychology and sociology. Everything has to be you know, for some you know, purpose or something, well, the, the, to achieve something. But most of our use of language, even with other people, isn't achieving anything more than maintaining a, a pleasant uh, social conditions, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Is okay. it okay if we go? Yeah. Okay. So there are two questions uh, here. The lady in the second row. Hi. My name is Edna Gilswold, Dublin City University. Uh, I'm a linguist. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about modularity of mind and some of the ideas that you're uh, speaking about here, in particular the structural properties of the linguistic system. Is that specific to the linguistic system or do you think that's related to other parts of the cognitive system? That's my first question. The second one is a bit, I guess, maybe, maybe more trivial, but for those individuals who don't have language for whatever reason, who fail to develop, is there a cognitive uh, impairment as well, would you see that? Is well? there a cognitive effect? impairment as well as a consequence? Like, are, how related are those two things? Well, um, first of all, about modularity, we have to make a distinction between two interpretations of that concept. Uh, the one that's in common use, actually, is Jerry's, Jerry Fodor's, uh, is uh, he's talking about modularity of processing systems. So it's the input systems that are modular, he's arguing. Uh, and uh, it would have to be extended to output systems, of course. Uh, according to him, the, what he calls the central systems have to be uh, uh, unstructured, quine and isotropic. You know? So there can't be any structure to the input systems. Uh, that does set up a problem. 
So for example, why do you uh, hear English and speak English? Why don't you hear English and speak Japanese? I mean, if the systems are unconnected, uh, why is that the case? Uh, well, uh, there has to be structure for the, in, for the central systems. And here you get a different notion of modularity, a notion of modularity that's more related to acquisition than processing. So given all the noise and confusion around you, how do things get sorted out into different systems? Well, that's where the internal system of modularity arises, and I think that's where your question comes. So what are the connections between, if any, about cows and the word cow? I had Jared Fodor in mind. Uh, his view <laughs> is, you know, you know his view. He says he, exactly what I said. A child sees a cow, somebody says cow, uh, that sets up the connection, and from then on, the sight of the cow causes its causal relation of the mental image image or notion or whatever it is, cow. And that simply does not stand up to examination. As soon as you begin to look at words, incidentally, this was pretty well understood in the 17th century. So if you read the uh, Locke, uh, Hume, uh, you know, the English Platonists, others, that, uh, they understood that uh, the, our, our, our concept, if you like, if uh, of an object is not uh, individuated by identifiable physical properties. So you read Locke on person, for example. He says persons, he didn't put in these terms, but what he, if you look at the kind of thought experiments Locke carried out with what if you have two minds in the same body, that kind of thing, what he's actually saying is that our concept of person is based on some notion like psychic continuity. Okay, psychic continuity is not a physical property. It's not something a physicist can discover. It's something that uh, we're imposing on the world. It's like the rigidity principle. In fact, for Locke, uh, he says person is what he calls a forensic concept. It carries with it notions like responsibility and rights. Well, you know, physicists can't look at an object and say, okay, he has responsibility and rights. Uh, actually, there's a, uh, this is known in the history of philosophy. There's a recent book on it by Galen Strawson who uh, brings up these things. He unfortunately doesn't refer to the history about them because nobody knows it. But, uh, the, uh, but that's correct. And, and that's just true of everything, including cows. Uh, so you can quickly make up simple thought experiments that show that notions like cow are also based on psychic continuity, among other properties. In fact, there's some uh, part of this that's very familiar to everyone, uh, fairy tales. Uh, infants have no problem understanding fairy tales. Uh, it's easy, you know, but uh, just think of the standard fairy tale. You know, the uh, wicked witch uh, uh, casts a spell on the uh, handsome prince and Turns, turns him into a frog, let's say. And for the rest of the story, the, the boar or something. Uh, but uh, this was studied carefully by a really outstanding linguist, uh, Ken Hale, about 40 years ago. He's one of the founders of Australian linguistics. And he did study languages which don't have number words. Uh, but he found that uh, the people First of all, they have other ways of expressing numbers. Like maybe they don't have the word five, but they can go like that. And uh, other ways of doing it. He also found that if these people are introduced into a market system, you know, they start selling and buying, they can do all the computations immediately. So they must have the whole number system. And the same thing appears to be true about color systems. Like a lot of the systems is well known that you know, there are languages that don't have color words sometimes beyond black and white. Uh, but as he found with uh, the Australian Aboriginal groups, uh, they have other ways of expressing it. So they may not have red, but they can say blood-like, you know. And uh, uh, so the whole conceptual system all seems to be there.
the arithmetic is particularly interesting because uh, where that comes from is, is an old problem. Actually, that goes back to the origins of evolutionary theory. So Darwin and Wallace uh, puzzled about the fact that uh, all humans, they, they didn't know all the data, but they were right, that all humans have uh, arithmetical capacity. And uh, that's a puzzle for them because it wasn't selected. It's never been used. So there was no selection. In fact, uh, using the arith arithmetical system is very recent and very restricted to small groups of people, but everybody's got it. So where did it come from? Uh, Wallace, in fact, thought that there has to be some other uh, uh, process in evolution beyond natural selection. Uh, Darwin didn't like that, so they debated it. Uh, what, what I think the answer in all these cases has to be that these things are kind of piggybacking on systems that are already there for some reason. In the case of arithmetic, if you look closely at language design, at the computational, the elementary computational principles that enter into the generative procedure, they actually yield arithmetic. If you take those procedures and you take a system with one element in the lexicon, call it one, it yields arithmetic. Uh, so it could, arithmetic just could be uh, you know, piggybacking on the system that's already there. But what about music? There is work, uh, some interesting work, trying to sh show that the basic properties of musical systems, which is, it picks up again in the 20th century, uh, partly because the concept with came to be understood uh, in, few, by, uh, in the 19. 30s and 40s with the development of the uh, theories of computability, Turing, uh, Gödel, Kleene, others. Uh, the notion of a finite characterization of an infinite class became uh, uh, well understood. And uh, that makes it possible to ask ourselves what would be the uh, uh, nature of the uh, sound meaning relationship, whatever it is. Well, the basic answer has to be that there's some kind of what's called generative procedure, finite computational procedure, uh, that determines the structures and the interpretations for an infinite range of categories of uh, expressions. And the interpretations have to be dual, one for sound, one for meaning. Uh, apart from that, uh, uh, for anyone who's not a mystic, uh, this capacity is internal to us. Uh, it's generally denied, but uh, a lot of mystics around. But uh, cl clearly it's something internal to us, mostly our brains, uh, which means it's effectively, the capacity is effectively uh, an organ of the body in the rather loose sense of organ that's used conventionally in biology, some subsystem of the organism that has enough internal integrity so it can be studied on its own and interacts with other such modules, systems, subsystems in the functioning of the, in the life of the organism. Uh, so that should be uncontroversial, and fortunately it isn't, but I'll put those controversies aside. Well, we've learned in recent years that the concept sound is too narrow. Uh, the uh, externalization of language, the form in which it reaches the outside seems to be modality independent. So it can be a visual, it can be sign, it can be touch, uh, a lot of interesting work on that and so on. There seems to be some internal analytic capacity that's common to any form of uh, uh, external uh, expression. Now that already suggests to us that maybe Aristotle's dictum should be inverted just as Galileo's observation does. Maybe it should be meaning with not sound, but some form of externalization. Well, I'll keep the sound here just for simplicity, but I mean any form of externalization. Uh, well, uh, if, uh, it, turns, it turns out that this distinction between... Well, if you walk in a forest, you no know, rigid objects around. And, uh, but somehow the system... It's probably true for other 
it hasn't been really tested on other organisms. It's hard to test, but it's probably true for apes and cats and so on. Uh, our system is just designed to impose uh, rigid objects in motion on virtually no data. And uh, that by now the mathematical properties have been worked out, the neurological properties less known. But again, you can't bring that to consciousness. And I think the same is true of speaking to yourself. Try it sometime. Uh, think about what you're actually doing when you talk to your, what you call talking to yourself. I think you'll find that what you're actually, what, what's actually in your mind consciously is just fragments, uh, little fragments flit by. And out of those fragments, you can suddenly construct a sentence, a, a, a meaningful sentence. And uh, that meaningful sentence is some, probably being constructed unconsciously, beyond the level of consciousness, internally, by whatever these generative processes are. And bits and pieces of it reach consciousness, like a couple of fragments of phrases. And uh, that's what we call thinking to ourselves. And by now, that's. Uh, you know, that, that seems to be true in other domains, too. There's some by now famous experiments, the Libet experiments on uh, uh, decision-making, which have been widely misinterpreted. Uh, but what was found was that if you decide to do something, say I decide to pick this up, uh, milliseconds before I decide, uh, something's going on in the motor areas, uh, namely the, the right you know, organization of motion to pick it up. Well, you know, the immediate conclusion was, that was drawn from this is, okay, that shows there's no freedom of will. It doesn't show anything of the sort. Uh, what it shows is that everything that's going on is beyond the level of consciousness, uh, which we know in every other domain, too. But as long as philosophy of mind is going to be bound by this dogma that you can't go beyond what's available to consciousness, or else it's not in the mind, it's never going to discover anything, uh, And I, I think. And there's a whole collection, and I think that dogma, too, probably goes back to behaviorism. I mean, it's pretty clear in Quine's case. It's uh, Quine, you may remember, distinguishes. Uh, it says, actions can be in accord with principles or guided by principles. That's all. Uh, in accord with principles means like the planets following Kepler's laws. You know. Uh, it, guided by principles means you formulate what you're going to do and then you do it. And much examination, uh, but uh, even if it did, it wouldn't begin to touch the real question, uh, which, has to do with, which has to do with the fact that the uh, number of associations of that kind, if you want to call them associations, is uh, unbounded. So it can't be set up by experience. Uh, that's the with problem has very rarely been noticed in the whole history of thinking about language. Occasionally it has. Uh, Galileo was maybe the first to uh, point out a pretty obvious fact uh, that uh, the language we, uh, our uh, language capacity has infinite scope. Uh, he described the alphabet as the greatest invention that had ever been made because it enables us with 25 letters to express uh, any thought that might come to our minds. Uh, notice that he's not accepting Aristotle's dictum exactly. Uh, that's a, an, a description of language as meaning with sound, which is not quite the same as sound with meaning. In fact, it differs in interesting ways. This is picked up not long after by Descartes. Uh, and in fact, for Descartes, it's uh, the foundation, uh, one of the foundations of his uh, dualistic science. This interesting and long story, also mostly ignored in the history of philosophy, but I think quite crucial. Uh, after that, it kind of languishes. It picks up again in the 20th century, uh, partly because the concept with came to be understood uh, in, few, by, uh, in the 19. 30s and 40s with the development of the uh, theories of computability, Turing, uh, Gödel, Kleene, others. Uh, the notion of a finite characterization of an infinite class became uh, uh, well understood. And uh, that makes it possible to uh, 
ask ourselves what would be the uh, uh, nature of the uh, sound meaning relationship, whatever it is. Well, the basic answer has to be that there's some kind of what's called generative procedure, finite computational procedure, uh, that determines the structures and the interpretations for an infinite range of categories of uh, expressions. And the interpretations have to be dual, one for sound, one for meaning. Uh, apart from that, uh, uh, for anyone who's not a mystic, uh, this capacity is internal to us. Uh, it's generally denied, but uh, a lot of mystics around. But uh, cl clearly it's something internal to us, mostly our brains. Uh, of course, there are going to be questions you can't answer, like uh, which is the you know, which is the ship, or who's the per which is the person in the box, but there's no reason why you should be able to answer them. Uh, why should our cognitive systems be developed so that any question you come up with, we have an intuitive answer to? No, they're not. Now, those are the traditional puzzles. And to find out why they're unanswerable, we have to look into the nature of our conceptual systems. And I think it's here that uh, ideas like, say, Jerry's uh, just founder right at the beginning. Because there are no, there is no way of, almost, try any, just about any word you can think of, no matter how simple, uh, you'll find that uh, it, it, it's, the concept is individuated by non-physical properties. Actually, this was noticed by Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle talks about it, uh, he talks about it in metaphysical terms. So he asks, uh, uh, what's a house, you know? Uh, what's the definition of house? He's not, he doesn't say the definition of the word house, the definition of the thing. This is in the metaphysics. Uh, and he says the definition of house is a combination of matter and form. Okay, so the matter is, uh, you know, boards and bricks and stuff like that. And the form is what it's used for, uh, what the design is, uh, things like that, which are, you know, this was all later reconstructed in the 17th century in epistemological terms, these is the cognitive structures uh, without Aristotle's metaphysics anymore of matter and form. But uh, I think the basic idea is right, that uh, uh, what uh, constitutes a concept for us is some combination of you know, things we perceive and uh, constructions that we impose on it by our complicated cognitive systems for which things like psychic continuity and design and use and so on are critical. Now if there's something that looks like a house, say, but it's used uh, to, uh, to store books, it's a library, it's not a house. And this holds of every term you can think of. Uh, river, tree, almost everything. Maybe everything. Everything has been looked at. Thanks. Ashley? Uh, hi. Um, I'm Ashley Green from Trinity College Dublin, Crossy. Um, so you, you started off, you, know, you started off with uh, some science of meaning. And this is really interesting. And, and then you, part, you, you sort of, you know, part of your explanation for this that there are certain... Otherwise, it's not in the mind. Uh, that's uh, totally hopeless. Uh, most of what go goes on internally is completely beyond the level of introspection. Uh, for example, the, the case that I mentioned. I mean, the principle which is pretty well established that linear order is not available for syntactic and semantic computation. You can't introspect into that. You, it's not conscious. Uh, the same is true of just visual perception. For example, one of the most interesting results in the study of visual perception is a, a conclusion that came out of uh, David Marr's lab, Shimon Ullman's principle, what, what's called the rigidity principle. Uh, this, they were able to show that if you present a subject with uh, uh, a tachistikot, Histoscopic presentations, you know, it's a screen with a couple of dots on it. If you have successive presentations, not many, maybe three or four presentations of a few dots 
on the screen. That what you perceive is a rigid object in motion. Okay, that's pretty curious too. Uh, in experience, you don't you have no experience with rigid objects. Uh, throughout all of human history, till very recently, there weren't any rigid objects. Like if you walk in a forest, you no rigid objects around. And uh, but somehow the system. It's probably true for other, it hasn't been really tested on other organisms, it's hard to test, but it's probably true for apes and cats and so on. Our system is just designed to impose uh, rigid objects in motion on virtually no data. And uh, that, by now, the mathematical properties have been worked out, the neurological properties less known. But again, you can't bring that to consciousness. And I think the same is true of speaking to yourself. Try it sometime. Think about what you're actually doing when you talk to your, what you call talking to yourself. I think you'll find that what you're actually, what, what's actually in your mind consciously is just fragments. Little fragments flit by. And out of those fragments, you can suddenly construct a sentence, a, a, a meaningful sentence. And uh, that meaningful sentence is some, probably being constructed unconsciously, beyond the level of consciousness, internally, by whatever these generative processes are. And bits and pieces of it reach consciousness, like a couple of fragments of phrases. And uh, that's what we call thinking to ourselves. And by now, that's, uh, you know, that, that seems to be true in other domains, too. There's some, by now, famous experiments, the Libet experiments on uh, well understood in the 17th century. So if you read the uh, Locke, uh, Hume, uh, you know, the English Platonists, others, uh, they understood that uh, the, our, our, our concept, if you like, if, uh, of an object is not uh, individuated by identifiable physical properties. So you read Locke on person, for example. This is persons, he didn't put in these terms, but what he, if you look at the kind of thought experiments Locke carried out with what if you have two minds in the same body, that kind of thing, what he's actually saying is that our concept of person is based on some notion like psychic continuity. Okay, psychic continuity is not a physical property. It's not something a physicist can discover. It's something that uh, we're imposing on the world. It's like the rigidity principle. In fact, for Locke, uh, he says person is what he calls a forensic concept. It carries with it notions like responsibility and rights. Well, you know, physicists can't look at an object and say, okay, he has responsibility and rights. Uh, actually, there's a, uh, this is known in the history of philosophy. There's a recent book on it by Galen Strawson, who uh, brings up these things. He unfortunately doesn't refer to the history about them because nobody knows it. But uh, the uh, but that's correct, and and that's just true of everything, including cows. Uh, so you can quickly make up simple thought experiments that show that notions like cow are, are also based on psychic continuity, among other properties. In fact, there's some uh, part of this that's very familiar to everyone. Uh, fairy tales. Uh, infants have no problem understanding fairy tales. Uh, it's easy, you know, but uh, just think of the standard fairy tale. You know, the uh, wicked witch uh, uh, casts a spell on the uh, handsome prince and turns, turns him into a frog, let's say. And for the rest of the story, the, the Prince has all the physical properties of a frog, all of them. Uh, then the beautiful princess kill, kisses the frog and becomes the handsome prince again. That means it always was the prince, didn't matter what its physical characteristics were, uh, because it's uh, uh, because what makes it a person is uh, this strange property of psychic continuity that runs through the whole thing. Always, and you can do the same. There's similar stories with animals, you know, turned into something and then turned back into themselves. It would have to be extended to output systems, of course.
according to him, the what he calls the central systems have to be uh, uh, unstructured, quine and isotropic. You know? So there can't be any structure to the input systems. Uh, that does set up a problem. So for example, why do you uh, hear English and speak English? Why don't you hear English and speak Japanese? I mean, if the systems are unconnected, uh, why is that the case? Uh, well, uh, there has to be structure for the, in, for the central systems. And here you get a different notion of modularity, a notion of modularity that's more related to acquisition than processing. So given all the noise and confusion around you, how do things get sorted out into different systems? Well, that's where the internal system of modularity arises, and I think that's where your question comes. So what are the connections between, if any, between the internal linguistic system and other cognitive systems? Uh, it's, it's an interesting question, and the way to, uh, there are other um, languages, uh, you, every group of humans that's ever been discovered has essentially the same, same kind of language. But there are, other, uh, there are other common properties that are found, uh, like music. Uh, just about, I think every society that's known, you know, uncontacted, uh, uh, so-called primitive, you know, hunter-gatherer tribes, they, they, they always have some kind of music, you know, drumming, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, I think they almost always have dance. That seems to be universal. Uh, these things just have no function at all. You know, like what's dance for? But uh, children pick it up instantly, uh, kind of automatically. Uh, every society has it. And you could ask the question whether uh, another thing that every known society has is arithmetical capacity. Now, that, there's a lot of misleading information about that. Now, it's often claimed that uh, you know, Aboriginal groups don't have arithmetic, uh, but that's based on the fact that they don't have number words, or they may have number words that only go to three or four or something. Uh, but uh, this was studied carefully by a really outstanding linguist, uh, Ken Hale, about 40 years ago. He's one of the founders of Australian linguistics, and he did study languages which don't have number words. Uh, but he found that uh, the people from left Africa, our ancestors left Africa, there's been no evolution of the language capacity. It's, changed, it's stayed identical. And there's very strong evidence for that. Uh, there's no difference that's detectable in capacity for language, any language, uh, in a Papua New Guinea uncontacted tribe and uh, you know, Dublin, uh, children are interchanged. They're, they'll grow up the way their society is. And that seems to be true of cognitive capacities generally. If there are group differences, they're so subtle that they're virtually undetectable. So that tells us that uh, something at least, uh, the UG, the language capacity, hadn't changed, hasn't evolved in roughly 50,000 or more years. Uh, the uh, with less confidence, but some, uh, you can suggest that if you go back another 50 or 100,000 years before that, there probably wasn't any language at all. Uh, there, if you look at the archeological, of course we have no fossil, fossil record, but if you look at the archeological evidence, there is a, a sudden uh, leap in creative activity, sometimes called the Great Leap Forward by paleoanthropologists, uh, roughly around 75,000, 100,000 years ago, somewhere in that neighborhood. And it's uh, you know, complex tools, uh, complex social arrangements, uh, 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 numerical development of numerical uh, representation of planetary, you know, uh, celestial. Uh, uh, events and so on and so forth. It's generally assumed, sort of plausibly, that's, that that's connected with the emergence of language, uh, which uh, differ with human language, which uh, differs radically along 
any dimension you can think of from uh, other uh, communi from any communication system that exists in other animals, primates, and so on. Well, uh, these are among the reasons. Of course, everyone would like to know something about the neural basis for language, uh, but it's uh, very difficult to explore the topic. Uh, one reason is it's disconnect. It's unrelated to any other systems that are known. Uh, so we know a lot about uh, the human visual system, uh, but that's because the human visual system is uh, quite similar to the visual systems of, say, monkeys and cats. And uh, rightly or wrongly, we allow ourselves to carry out invasive experimentation uh, with other organisms. So you can learn about their visual systems. That tells you something about ours. Uh, so something about the neurophysiology of the human visual system. If you walk in a forest, you no know, rigid objects around. And, uh, but somehow the system, uh, it's probably true for other, uh, it hasn't been really tested on other organisms. It's hard to test, but it's probably true for apes and cats and so on. Uh, our system is just designed to impose uh, rigid objects in motion on virtually no data. And uh, that by now, the mathematical properties have been worked out, the neurological properties less known. But again, you can't bring that to consciousness. And I think the same is true of speaking to yourself. Try it sometime. Think about what you're actually doing when you talk to your, what you call talking to yourself. I think you'll find that what you're actually, what's actually in your mind consciously is just fragments. Little fragments flit by. And out of those fragments, you can suddenly construct a sentence, a meaningful sentence. And that meaningful sentence is probably being constructed unconsciously, beyond the level of consciousness, internally, by whatever these generative processes are. And bits and pieces of it reach consciousness, like a couple of fragments of phrases. And that's what we call thinking to ourselves. And by now, that's. Uh, you know, that, that seems to be true in other domains, too. There's some by now famous experiments, the Libet experiments on uh, uh, decision making, which have been widely misinterpreted. Uh, but what was found was that if you decide to do something, say I decide to pick this up, uh, milliseconds before I decide, uh, something's going on in the motor areas, uh, namely the, the right you know, organization of motion to pick it up. Well, you know, the immediate conclusion was, that was drawn from this is, OK, that shows there's no freedom of will. It doesn't show anything of the sort. Uh, what it shows is that everything that's going on is beyond the level of consciousness, uh, which we know in every other domain, too. But as long as philosophy of mind is going to be bound by this dogma that you can't go beyond what's available to consciousness, or else it's not in the mind, it's never going to discover anything, uh, And I, I think. And there's a whole collection, and I think that dogma, too, probably goes back to behaviorism. I mean, it's pretty clear in Quine's case. It's uh, Quine, you may remember, distinguishes. Uh, it says, actions can be in accord with principles or guided by principles. That's all. Uh, in accord with principles means like the planets following Kepler's laws. You know. Uh, it, guided by principles means you formulate what you're going to do and then you do it. And words that only go to three or four or something. Uh, but uh, this was studied carefully by a really outstanding linguist, uh, Ken Hale, about 40 years ago. He's one of the founders of Australian linguistics. And he did study languages which don't have number words. Uh, but he found that uh, the people First of all, they have other ways of expressing numbers. Like maybe they don't have the word five, but they can go like that. And uh, other ways of doing it. He also found that if these people are introduced into a market system, you know, they start selling and buying, they can do all the computations immediately. So they must have the whole number system. And the same appears to be true about color systems. Like a lot of the systems is well known that you know, there are languages that don't have color words sometimes beyond black and white. Uh, but as he found with uh, the Australian Aboriginal groups, uh, 
they have other ways of expressing it. So they may not have red, but they can say blood-like, you know. And uh, uh, so the whole conceptual system all seems to be there. The arithmetic is particularly interesting because uh, where that comes from is, is an old problem. Actually, that goes back to the origins of evolutionary theory. So Darwin and Wallace uh, puzzled about the fact that uh, all humans, they, they didn't know all the data, but they were right, that all humans have uh, arithmetical capacity. And uh, that's a puzzle for them because it wasn't selected. It's never been used. So there was no selection. In fact, the, using the arith arithmetical system is very recent and very restricted to small groups of people, but everybody's got it. So where did it come from? Uh, Wallace, in fact, thought that there has to be some other uh, uh, process in evolution beyond natural selection. Uh, Darwin didn't like that, so they debated it. Uh, what, what I think the answer in all these cases has to be that these things are kind of piggybacking on systems that are already there for some reason. In the case of arithmetic, if you look closely at language design, at the computational, the elementary computational principles that enter into the generative procedure, they actually yield arithmetic. If you take those procedures and you take a system with one element in the lexicon, call it one, it yields arithmetic. Uh, so it could, arithmetic just could be uh, you know, piggybacking on the system that's already there. But what about music? There is work, uh, some interesting work, trying to sh show that the basic property... And then moved across the road, which is the point yeah. of the example. So, so my question is, um, at least for the latter kind of examples, um, how is it that we are able to use those sentences so easily to convey a truth because it seems on first inspection at least that you know if a sentence either asserts or presupposes the existence of an object that, that does not exist and indeed in many of these cases an object um, that could not exist it seems on first inspection like they should either just come out false or that they should come out as you know presupposition failures actually i should mention that Paul is the only person who writes on somatics who takes any of this seriously, so it's, <laughs> it's unique. Uh, but uh, I think what it means is just that most of what we do is unreflective. It's, uh, it's kind of like uh, seeing a rigid object in motion when there's, or seeing the moon illusion or uh, understanding other people, we have the slightest idea how we do it. Uh, we can't introspect into our own behavior uh, any more than we can introspect into uh, falling bodies. I mean, it's just intuitively obvious that if you have two, two objects of different mass, uh, the one with uh, uh, larger mass is going to fall faster. Well, it turns out to be false, but it's, uh, if we can't introspect into something as simple as, uh, say, falling bodies, or why some things fall and others rise, uh, how can we hope to introspect into anything as complicated as what the human mind is doing? You've got to study it from the outside, the way you study other things. And when you do, it's very hard. Uh, there are illusions about, uh, one of the main illusions in the goes through all of intellectual history is that uh, somehow the uh, ourself we ourselves ought to be the easiest thing to study because we can look into what's going on so say you know Tom Nagel asks uh, what it's like to be a bat and uh, nobody can give the answer but try answering the question what it's like to be me I mean I don't think anybody can answer that question either. At least I can't. Uh, it's, uh, uh, you, just, you can't pose questions like that. Uh, they, they don't mean anything. Uh, we, uh, to, to figure out what it's like to be me, or a bat, or a, a, you know, a nematode, or no matter how simple it is, is a hard humans. They, they didn't 
know all the data, but they were right that all humans have an arithmetical capacity. And uh, that's a puzzle for them because it wasn't selected. It's never been used. So there was no selection. In fact, uh, using the arith arithmetical system is very recent and very restricted to small groups of people, but everybody's got it. So where did it come from? Uh, Wallace, in fact, thought that there has to be some other uh, process in evolution beyond natural selection. Uh, Darwin didn't like that, so they debated it. Uh, what, what I think the answer in all these cases has to be that these things are kind of piggybacking on systems that are already there for some reason. In the case of arithmetic, if you look closely at language design, at the computational, the elementary computational principles that enter into the generative procedure, they actually yield arithmetic. If you take those procedures and you take a system with one element in the lexicon, call it one, it yields arithmetic. Uh, so it could, arithmetic just could be uh, you know, piggybacking on the system that's already there. But what about music? There is work, uh, some interesting work, trying to sh show that the basic properties of musical systems uh, are similar to the structural properties of linguistic systems. There's quite interesting work on that, and maybe that'll come out. Uh, dance, you could try this. Actually, Nelson Goodman tried to do something with dance. But uh, I think these are really good questions because you have to ask where do these things come from? In the case of language, uh, we have no idea where it came from, but you can imagine a way in which it could have evolved suddenly, some slight rewiring of the brain, and maybe the other things just spin off it. Or maybe there's some other origin. That's a good question. But in order to study it, you have to accept the notion of modularity that is not used in the philosophical literature. Not input modularity, but rather central modularity. And that's what's explicitly denied by Fodor and implicitly denied quite generally. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Chomsky. I'm, uh I'm a student of linguistics in UCD in my third year. Um, one of the things is when you mentioned the, the cow, it, I was suddenly reminded I went to a coffee shop but just before I arrived here and somebody's looking for the toilet door and they were indicated to a, to a bookshelf that is the door. And so in a sense, I'm surrounded by toilet doors in here. It's a beautiful building. So that idea that what it Well, what they're claiming is something quite, uh, they already internalized the change of the conception of science from trying to discover an intelligible world given up by the time Newton's discoveries sank in uh, to trying to discover intelligible theories. And maybe we can de develop an intelligible theory about anything, ever, you know, about almost anything, maybe anything you can think of. But that doesn't mean that the world's going to be intelligible. So Mysterianism just almost has to be true. I think it was proven by uh, Newton, in fact, though he didn't like it. He thought it was absurd. Uh, Hume recognized it, recognized, look, it's true. What can we do with it? Uh, Locke recognized it. So Locke, you know, uh, uh, one of his great insights was, you know, what's called Locke's suggestion in the history of philosophy that uh, he said that just as there are, he put it the theological framework, but we can extract it from that. Uh, what he said is just as God added to matter uh, properties which we cannot comprehend, like action at a distance. Uh, so God might have super added to matter uh, a faculty of thinking. It's the hypothesis of thinking matter, which was then it kind of opened up the possibility of, of really having a scientific psychology. It's kind of dropped for a couple of centuries, but that's it, basically. Uh, and you have to try to figure out, well, what is the property of whatever's in there that uh, uh, allows thinking. But I think that gets right back to your question. Uh, we can, with our scientific capacities, we can look at this and say, hey, there's something really wrong here. We have to have another system for describing it, which doesn't have these internal contradictions. 
and that's just a different system than uh, what we call common sense or ordinary ways of looking at things. And within the, that system, you can develop, in fact, you try to develop a notion of reference. So in, say, physics or linguistics or any other uh, kind of organized inquiry, you, you hope that the entities that you construct, mental entities that you construct, symbolic entities, you hope that they uh, actually pick out something that exists in the world. So if you scientists think they found the Higgs boson, uh, they would like to believe that there is a Higgs boson out there, you know. And uh, if uh, linguists talk about phonemes, they'd like to say, you know, there's something real that's a phoneme. Uh, but that's a totally different notion from the ones in our ordinary language. Uh, in fact, this leads to, uh, which is a curious fact, because a computational procedure is involved, which is quite complex. Uh, there, there is a minimal distance relation that is true of the actual linkage, but it's minimal structural distance. It's distance, it's the closest, the two things that are closest to each other when you look into the structures. And that's a computational, complex computational problem. On the other hand, it worked the other way, uh, through proximity instead of structural distance, it would be a trivial computational problem. You just check the closest verb to instinctively or to can, and that's the one it's associated with. Now that's elementary, elementary computational problem. But uh, language doesn't use the simple computation. It uses a complex one, which ought to be puzzling, uh, and is puzzling, I think. And in, uh, it's not just true of these examples, it's true of every construction that's known in every language that's known. So there's something far-reaching about it. Uh, well, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the general principle, minimal search, you know, closest distance, that's all over the place in language. And uh, probably it's just uh, kind of a ref uh, effect of the general property of minimal computation that I mentioned. Uh, in this case, there is some supporting evidence from neuroscience. Uh, one of the most interesting experimental results in neuroscience has to do exactly with this. Uh, it involve, it's, an, it's a work done in Milan. Uh, the, for those of you who are linguists, the linguist involved is Andrea Moro, other biologists. Uh, the, uh, they investigated the following paradigm. Take, uh, say, speakers of German, and, uh, and give them two nonsense languages, invented languages, uh, one of which satisfies the properties of, say, Italian, which they don't know, and the other uh, is designed to violate principles of universal grammar. So in this connection, uh, take an invented language in which the, you negate a sentence by putting the negative particle after the third word, let's say. Uh, language does it in a much more complex way with using structural distance. Well, it turns out that uh, for the case of the nonsense language that satisfies UG principles, you get normal brain activation in the uh, uh, language areas. Uh, for the case that violates UG principles, like having negation as the third word. I mean, it's, it's very threatening. You just can't do it, you know. Uh, try it sometimes. <laughs> so you're kind of forced to talk to the people. You don't have to bus stop. You talk to the person who's next to you. But uh, it's, you're not conveying information. You're just maintaining some kind of uh, social interaction that's comfortable. So I don't think it should be, even those things should be called communication. It's. Uh, uh, again, the, the idea of using communication comes from this kind of instrumentalist approach to this study of uh, psychology and sociology. Everything has to be you know, for some you know, purpose or something, well, the, the, to achieve something. But most of our use of language, even with other people, isn't achieving anything more than maintaining a, a pleasant uh, social conditions. You know. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah.
Is it okay if we go? Yeah. Okay. So there are two questions uh, here. The lady in the second row. Um, properties of the linguistic system, is that specific to the linguistic system or do you think that's related to other parts of the cognitive system? That's my first question. The second one is a bit, I guess, maybe, maybe more trivial, but for those individuals who don't have language, for whatever reason, who fail to develop, is there a cognitive uh, impairment as well? Would you see that? Is well? there a cognitive impairment as well as a consequence? Like, how related are those two things? Well, um, first of all, about modularity, we have to make a distinction between two interpretations of that concept. Uh, the one that's in common use, actually, is Jerry, Jerry Fodor's, uh, is uh, he's talking about modularity of processing systems. So it's the input systems that are modular, he's arguing. Uh, and it would have to be extended to output systems, of course. Uh, according to him, the, what he calls the central systems have to be uh, uh, unstructured, quine and isotropic. You know? So there can't be any structure to the input systems. Uh, th that does set up a problem. So for example, why do you uh, hear English and speak English? Why don't you hear English and speak Japanese? I mean, if the systems are unconnected, why is that the case? Uh, well, uh, there has to be structure for the, in, for the central systems. And here you get a different notion of mud. There probably wasn't any language at all. Uh, there, if you look at the archeological, of course we have no fossil, fossil record, but if you look at the archeological evidence, there is a, a sudden uh, leap in creative activity, sometimes called the Great Leap Forward by paleoanthropologists, now, roughly around 75,000, 100,000 years ago, somewhere in that neighborhood. And it's uh, you know, complex tools, uh, complex social arrangements, uh, 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 numerical development of numerical uh, representation of planetary, you know, uh, celestial. Uh, uh, events and so on and so forth. It's generally assumed, sort of plausibly, that's, that that's connected with the emergence of language, uh, which uh, differ with human language, which uh, differs radically along any dimension you can think of from uh, other uh, from any communication system that exists in other animals, primates, and so on. Well, uh, these are among the reasons, of course, everyone would like to know something about the neural basis for language, uh, but it's uh, very difficult to explore the topic. Uh, one reason is it's disconnect, it's unrelated to any other systems that are known. Uh, so we know a lot about uh, the human visual system, uh, but that's because the human visual system is uh, quite similar to the visual systems of, say, monkeys and cats. and rightly or wrongly, we allow ourselves to carry out invasive experimentation uh, with other organisms. So you can learn about their visual systems. That tells you something about ours. Uh, so something about the neurophysiology of the human visual system is understood. Uh, but that's not going to work for language. There just are no other organisms. So there's no other one to look at uh, because there's no analogous system anywhere in the biological world. There's kind of very weak analogies uh, you know, with birds and ants, but it's evolutionarily so remote, can't possibly tell you anything. Uh, it's, uh, so the com comparative study is out. Uh, we don't allow ourselves to do invasive experiments with humans. You can think of all kinds of possible experiments that could teach you a lot, but you can't carry them out. Uh, so that means uh, research in this domain has to be sophisticated and uh, indirect. Uh, some things are learned, but uh, not a lot. Uh, nevertheless, I think it is possible to say something about the essential function of language, you know, the core property of it. 
Uh, but the way to do that, the only way I know, since